I understand you actually have a life and we wish you well, but we do want to thank you for all the work you've done for us in the last five years. We've gotten very detailed in this report as we should. Uh, I kind of wanted to get a little bit 30,000 feet up and just big picture um, in the five years that you've been monitoring our jails, uh, can you tell us what the biggest changes have been, both positive and negative? Have we, what's the biggest positive that we've moved forward on, and have we gone backwards anywhere? I mean, I think the biggest positive is um, that the culture in the jails has changed uh, mm -hmm. that um, there's not a sense of we need to use force to um, to ensure um, compliance by uh, inmates um, mm -hmm. and that um, that there's more use of communication skills. Um, there's better training, um, and and I, I I think the tension level in the jails has gone down as a result of all, all of that. Um, mm. I, I think, um, and I, this is I'm now looking at this more than just five years because I've been involved with the the since um, since 2011. Um, so I, I think there's been a substantial change in the attitude and the approach um, and the communications in the jails and in the, the level of force that's used. Um, it's very, very rare that you see um, significant Category 3 use of force involving um, serious injuries to inmates. Um, in, pr prior to uh, the CCJB, um, broken bones uh, that inmates suffered was not a, an uncommon uh, situation. Um, that, that rarely happens now. Um, and uh, the department, um, they, they require uh, all force to be reported. They treat that very seriously. Um, and the cameras there are in place and let you see what, what happens. So, Mm -hmm. There's been a significant change in both the use of force and in the culture in the tales, uh, and 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 a very positive one. Um, mm -hmm. uh, Have we gone backwards anywhere? I don't know that we've gone backwards anywhere. I think that there are areas where where we we just haven't made the progress that you would think they would have made, and it and it it's really um, in providing um, the, the treatment. Um, and the programming for uh, inmates suffering uh, mental illnesses. Um, that's been uh, a sort of frustration that they haven't made more progress in, in that area than, than they, I would like to have seen. Um, mm -hmm. I don't think they've gone backwards as such. Mm -hmm. they, they just haven't made the progress that, that I would like. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. And uh, I've noticed that uh, the number of administrative investigations opened by the sheriff's department has decreased each year, hitting an all-time low last year in 2019. In your opinion, is this cause for concern or is this more reflection of the, pro of the progress that we're making? Um, let's put that in, in context. Um, there, was a, a, there were two reports by the uh, in, um, Inspector General's office uh, in the first six months um, after uh, Sheriff Villanueva came into office, which uh, seemed to indicate a significant drop off in the number of administrative investigations. Um, and, it, and I think that was some cause for concern. Um, now, there were some explanations, uh, and, I, and I, I did get from the department. Um, summaries of all of the um, prior uh, investigations that had been discontinued um, and the number that then in the second half of, of 2019 uh, was 
pretty similar to the number that had been in the second half of 2018 when Sheriff McDonald's last was Sheriff McDonald's last year. Um, so I, I was less concerned um, that there was a um, that there was really going to be a push to um, decrease the number of, of administrative investigations. Um, it's still uh, at a you know a, 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 a ten year low, um, and so it's a little bit hard to assess whether that's a significant problem. Uh, but when I compared the second six months under Sheriff in Illinois, but to the last six months under um, Sheriff McDonald, um, they were pretty similar in terms of the numbers. Um, so I think it's something that needs to be watched. Um, and I think the uh, Office of Inspector General is in a good position to do that. Um, I'm less concerned about it than I was when I read the uh, Inspector General's report in uh, 2019. Okay, well, thank you. And again, thank you for your service and the work that you've done uh, to ensure the safety of our jails and those who reside within them. Thank you very much. Thank you, Thanks. Madam Chair. Thank you, Supervisor Solis. Yes, thank you, Madam Chair. And I also want to thank our court-appointed jail monitor, uh, Mr. Richard Drian, for your work. Um, I know that this has been an uh, extremely difficult time for us in the last few years, but more importantly, as you stated in your comments and report regarding COVID-19 and how that has impacted some of the uh, progress in certain areas. Um, but as you, you and I know, back in 2015, the DOJ reached this agreement with the county and the sheriff's department to, in fact, protect people inside LA County jails from serious suicide risks and excessive force, and to ensure that the Sheriff's Department provided constitutionally required adequate care for people who are incarcerated with serious mental illness. And as you know, the settlement agreement would ensure that those reforms ordered by the courts would be fully implemented in an environment of transparency to ensure that the most vulnerable in our jails were protected while they were being held. I believe it's imperative that we continue to protect at all costs people with mental health needs from harm, harassment, and abuse by custody deputies. Um, concurrently, the county must continue its efforts, I believe, in creating a care first jail last vision and focus on continuing to decarcerate and decriminalize people with mental illness and mental health needs. Um, though this report indicates there were over 30 provisions in the settlement agreement with the Sheriff's Department and we're in substantial compliance, what remains is that there is still major concern that there's still such an adequacy in the offering of therapeutic services and a lack of structure in mental health treatment and a lack of out of cell time for people with mental health needs, all of which I believe are vital to ensure that those with serious mental illness recover. It seems like under these circumstances, the people with mental health needs will continue to decompensate while their illnesses become more acute. This is um, something that I really believe that our, our board has really tried to address as we move forward to embrace the care first, jail last vision. And we have been taking steps, as has been outlined and mentioned by some of the board members. Supervisor Kuehl mentioned some of the reforms that were already taking place with the recent passage of Measure J and also the uh, working group that we have looking at MCJ as well as the alternatives to incarceration and other reforms. I believe all of those are in fact outside areas that are taking place that perhaps your jurisdiction uh, as was pointed out by Supervisor Kuehl may be a, a little disjointed. That's why I think we do have to continue to work towards seeing how we can provide the best uh, planning for the future for those inmates that will remain in our care and to provide those that don't um, pose a serious threat to be released and uh, integrated back into our communities through other community-based uh, programming and things of that nature. So I do want to thank you for your help and your assistance uh, and your response in your report. And I know that uh, this is your last report to our board and you'll be retiring after serving in this job for the last five years. And I want to thank you again for your service to the residents of LA County. And just regarding your conclusion in the report that despite the progress, we still face, 
face many challenges in addressing mental health provisions uh, as, outlined in, as outlined in the uh, settlement. So again, I want to thank you and hope that we can continue as the board moves forward to again prioritize the Care First Jail Last um, components that we all know uh, we'll be also voting on at this meeting that I help will reform and really help to uh, put in place the kinds of support systems that uh, this report has has pointed out to us. So thank you very much, Mr. Druyan, for your for your support and for your um, your courage and being a part of uh, this uh, problem solving effort. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And, and Ms. Green, one last thing. You know, it, it occurred to me when you talked about staffing, before Dr. Galley left to go up to the state, um, he came to this board and asked um, the board to authorize incentives to get staffing increases based on, you know, paying off medical um, tuition and things like that. And so I'm going to ask for a status um, from, uh, I guess it's DHS and and. DMH um, regarding and the CEO regarding where we are on that and and how the staffing is going and what we can do to ensure the staffing levels are adequate and um, and that we are providing proper care for those individuals that are currently housed in our jail. So with that, any other comments? Chair, if I may. Supervisor Ridley Thomas. Uh, I begin by thanking um, Richard Drurian for his um, service. Um, we've had any number of conversations over the decade, beginning with the uh, Commission on Jail Violence, uh, where he served admirably um, and uh, continued the work of monitoring. Um, and so it's been a full uh, decade, uh, Richard, and you've had a front row seat as it relates to reform in the county of Los Angeles. You're no stranger to this in terms of your knowledge at the city uh, of Los Angeles as well, so you have a, a basis for comparison. And I think considerable progress um, has been made at least conceptually in terms of what reform means, uh, what it looks like, and it has evolved to a level of policy that I think is rather uh, substantial. Uh, we uh, lay claim to care first and jail last um, as um, uh, what we aspire to, and I think it's uh, appropriate and I further believe um, that all of what we do should <clears throat> square with that, should uh, align with that, uh, should uh, cohere uh, in a way that causes us to uh, speak um, in a manner uh, that causes us to continue to refine uh, what rehabilitation model look like, um, should look like, uh, and that work is yet in, in process. Working group is in place doing that, um, uh, guided in part by the CEO along with the uh, respective health departments, uh, and it's a good thing. And so <clears throat> the work continues uh, to evolve. It's important work. Uh, is unmistakably critical in terms of uh, issues of human rights, issues of uh, civil rights. Uh, and just think, uh, uh, Richard, you started all of this and you uh, go off into retirement with a sense of uh, perspective uh, that should cause you to uh, be uh, proud of what you have been associated with. And with that, Madam Chair, I wish Mr. Drurian uh, the best in his retirement. Thank you. Well, thank you, Supervisor uh, Ridley Thomas. I, I would say that this, I think, started uh, when you and uh, Supervisor Molina and Supervisor Yarosofsky 
uh, and others uh, pushed for um, reforms and the CCJV um, review of uh, jail operations. I think that back in 2011 really started the ball rolling. And I think things have made substantial progress. And I think, uh, as you point out, um, things have evolved as well. And, and there are new things, new challenges. So yep. I appreciate the opportunity to have served the county. Thank you. Thank you. So this item is before us, and I've asked for a report back on the status of uh, staffing uh, in our jails under DHS with CEO report back with that Madam Executive Officer. I'll move it, seconded by Supervisor Hahn, Madam Executive Officer. Item six to receive mm -hmm. a file and request for report back. I'm, I'm asking for a report back on um, what Dr. Galley came and talked to the board about in terms of getting staffing in our jails at the current level, and Dr. Or, uh, Richard Drurian referenced the fact of staffing um, level in, needs, continues to be a problem. Mm -hmm. So I just want to know what the status is of our recruitment in our jails. So, uh, Madam, Madam Chair, you did distribute a proposed motion last night. I'm not, that no, I'm not introducing that motion. Okay. I see. So just a report yeah. for uh, yeah. asking for a report back on staffing Cor levels. Cor correct. I just, um, when, doc when, when Dr. Green, uh, when Mr. Green was talking about the staffing levels, I had a, uh -huh. I, I remembered how Dr. Galley came in and talked to us about how hard it was to get staffing there. Yeah. And there were a lot of staff that were um, working double shifts and mm -hmm. asked him to do mm -hmm. some incentives. And then it it kind of dropped off when he went up to Sacramento. And I was just wondering what the status is of our recruitment efforts in our jails. Mm -hmm. That was it. That was okay. what I was asking so for a report. That, so that's it. I think we have to always clarify for the, you yeah. know, for the minutes. Cause, um, yeah. so the, the motion that we saw is not being uh, asked by you, but only a report back on staffing levels and how they might be improved. I have not introduced a motion other than the, my verbal report back. Thank you very much, Madam Chair. I, I appreciate the clarification. You got it. All right, Madam I Executive have, Officer. Item six to receive a file and request a report back on recruitment efforts is before you, Supervisor Solis. Aye. Supervisor Solis. Aye. Supervisor Billy Thomas. Aye. Supervisor Billy Thomas. Aye. Supervisor Kuhl. Aye. Supervisor Kuhl. Aye. Supervisor Hahn. Aye. Supervisor Hahn. Aye. Supervisor Barger. Aye. Supervisor Barger. Aye. Motion carries five to zero. Thank you. Now we're going to go on to item number 10, ratification of Assembly Bill 1185 McCarty uh, on Sheriff Oversight in Los Angeles County. That was held by Supervisor Solis. Yes, thank you, Madam Chair. And, and thank you also to Supervisor Kuehl for co-authoring this motion, just as you did when uh, the motion I authored back in August. Uh, when I put forward the motion in August, it was very apparent that we as the board needed our county legislative affairs team to advocate for assembly member McCarthy's bill, AB 1185. As you know, AB 1185 would allow board of supervisors across the counties in California to create a sheriff's oversight commission and inspector general. And additionally, these bodies would also be given subpoena power. Thankfully, our good governor signed the bill into law at the end of September. And, in, and as you know, Los Angeles County and the board was proactive in creating the Office of Inspector General in 2014 and the Sheriff's Civilian Oversight Commission back in 2016 to ensure transparency and hold the Sheriff's Department accountable. And due to the incredible hard work and persistence of the community, and I have to give them a big shout out, all the advocates, in March of this year, the voters of Los Angeles County enhanced the oversight ability of the commission by giving it subpoena power. This board and I have continued to keep sheriff transparency and accountability as a top priority, and I recognize that oversight of law enforcement is a big part of public safety, and I'll continue to support these oversight bodies that the board has created with the community, and I will continue to demand that the sheriff comply with the law to collaborate with the Civilian Oversight Commission and allow the Office of Inspector General to do its job of conducting independent investigations. This motion is another reflection, I believe, of our commitment. In January 1st, 2021, AB 1185 will become law of this state and LA County will comply with the law. Public safety, as you know, can't be assured if law enforcement is above the law. 
Thank you very much, Madam Chair. Thank you, Supervisor Kuehl. Uh, thank you very much, Madam Chair. Thanks to Supervisor Solis for bringing this motion and inviting me to co-author. Uh, we are uh, asking our colleagues to join us in ratifying all of the uh, aspects of AB 1185, but in an interesting way, it's actually the other way around because we were already doing this, and 1185 has indicated that if other counties wish to do it, um, to ratify the power, it also uh, underscores that the county actually has the subpoena power and uh, is able to delegate it, uh, and um, that is what we have been saying. But it does add one thing, because we already have a Civilian Oversight Commission, we already have an Office of Inspector General, uh, because it was allowed by law and also approved by our voters in Measure R, so the COC also has subpoena power. So what we're really doing is, I think, taking one remaining step by ratifying uh, and adopting uh, the uh, the uh, uh, sections of 1185, and that is to empower our Inspector General with subpoena power as well. So I was very pleased to co-author the motion and ask for a yes vote. Thank you. Thank you. Seeing no one else has requested to speak on this item, it is before us moved by Supervisor Solis, seconded by Supervisor Kuehl to approve this item. Madam Executive Officer, please call the roll. Item 10 is before you, Supervisor Solis. Aye. Supervisor Solis, aye. Supervisor Riley Thomas. Aye. Supervisor Riley Thomas, aye. Supervisor Kuehl. Aye. Supervisor Kuehl, aye. Supervisor Hahn. Aye. Supervisor Hahn, aye. Supervisor Barger. Aye. Supervisor Barger, aye. Motion carries five to zero. Now we are on item number 14, Comprehensive Public Safety Reinvestment Plan. Supervisor Sleesh, you held this item? Yes, thank you again, Madam Chair. When 1.3 million residents of L.A. County overwhelmingly voted for Measure R, the Civilian Police Oversight Commission and the Jail Plan Initiative in March of 2020, the voters supported the two items that this measure would do. And that is, one, it would grant the Sheriff's Civilian Oversight Commission subpoena power. Two, it would authorize the commission to develop a plan to reduce the jail population and incarceration in L.A. County. The commission has unfortunately had to use the newly granted subpoena power against the sheriff in May of 2020 as the sheriff continues to show his contempt of the will of the community through his defiance. The second component of Measure R, however, still needs to be actualized. The commission in response did create an ad hoc committee as the commission uh, to release a report to to the public and to the board, a feasibility study to reduce Los Angeles County's jail population and to reinvest jail system costs in prevention and mental health treatment, including a timeline for resourcing and implementing strategies to meet the goal. Um, I understand that the task is a large undertaking and due to the commitment of the board through its embrace of the Care First Jail Last approach, some of the work may have been done uh, due to the board created Alternatives to Incarceration Initiative and the recent hiring of the Executive Director over the initiative. However, we still wait for a comprehensive plan to be delivered and implemented. So this motion uh, will help us provide uh, that tool to allow us to move forward and provide for the Commission to provide a report back to us so we can fulfill uh, what we were asked to do by the voters. And I would ask that uh, the draft of the plan be um, introduced back to us by December 8th of this year in collaboration, obviously, with the various criminal justice partners like the ATI Initiative, ODR, and community stakeholders. And I look forward to their public presentation of a strategy on the delivery of the voter-supported plan by January 20th, uh, January 26th of 2021. Thank you very much, Madam Chair, and I ask for your I vote. Seeing that nobody else is requested to speak on this item, it is before us. Item number 14 is before us. Moved by Supervisor Solid, seconded by Supervisor Kuehl. Madam Executive Officer, please call the roll. Item 14 is before you, Supervisor Solis. Aye. Supervisor Solis, aye. Supervisor Riley Thomas. Aye. Supervisor Riley Thomas, aye. Supervisor Kuehl. Aye. 
Supervisor Kyo, aye. Supervisor Han? Supervisor Han? Supervisor aye. Aye. Supervisor, aye. Supervisor Barger? Aye. Supervisor Barger, aye. Motion carries five to zero. Thank you. Now we are moving on to item number 16, report regarding options for removing the sheriff. This was held by Supervisor Ridley Thomas. Well, thank you very much, uh, Madam Chair. Um, and I want to thank Supervisor Kuhl for uh, co-authoring uh, this um, motion. Um, I want to say thank you also to the well over 600 people who took time to make a uh, comment on this issue. Uh, it should be clear to everyone that the sheriff has the critical responsibility of protecting the public safety and as the manager for a law enforcement agency that is the largest um, county in the nation. Um, the sheriff is responsible for providing uh, services in more than 40 cities and over uh, 100 unincorporated areas. And Madam uh, Chair, um, it's fair to say that this expansive authority and responsibility of the sheriff's department significantly impacts the everyday lives of county residents. May I assert that accountability matters. Its absence contributes to violations of constitutional and human rights. It inhibits the department's efforts to make public uh, safety real and or believable, and too often it undermines the rule of law, an essential part of life in a uh, democratic society. In passing Measure R, um, which we just discussed, this past month, month March, uh, you know, voters overwhelmingly indicated that they want a sheriff who is accountable to more than just a four-year election cycle. Uh, but despite expansive efforts to increase public confidence through oversight over the past several years, achieving fundamental reforms remain a challenge, to put it mildly. So to ensure the public safety and the administration of justice, uh, the county must thoroughly assess its ability to hold um, the sheriff accountable and explore a full range of options to ensure transparency. Uh, Madam Chair and colleagues, uh, uh, I wish to make reference to um, uh, uh, an article that was written in February of 2014. Um, I submitted this to the Huffington Post and it seems to me to be apt uh, for our consideration today. Uh, permit me to read the following. In 1850, the Los Angeles County Sheriff's Department was mostly a volunteer organization that served a population of just over 3,000 people. And Los Angeles was really uh, what might be described as the Wild West, thousands of men with gold fever were rushing into our new state. Fugitives from justice found California a safe hideout. Uh, shootouts and duels were common and Los Angeles held the dubious distinction of having the highest murder rate in the nation. Uh, that was in 1850. Uh, fast forward to where we are today, uh, members of the board, and you'll find that despite the exponential growth in the county's population, now well over 10 million in contrast to 3,000. And tremendous advances of modern day uh, policing. We are still uh, beholden to what could be described as an anach anachronistic model of law enforcement. We hold a popularity contest for arguably our most important law enforcement position try to imagine electing a chief of police, and then we are left without a mechanism to ensure transparency and to hold the sheriff accountable. The result, 
is that we have something worse than democracy. We have the illusion of democracy. Uh, but real democracy we provides for civic engagement. The franchise is neither the beginning nor the end of citizens' rights and responsibility. It means it is a means to an end. Furthermore, real democracy provides a means for civic engagement such as an independent uh, citizens oversight paddle because there is an expectation of public participation and guidance. When dealing with law enforcement, uh, that means a constant dialogue between the public and law enforcement with respect to civil rights, transparency, and accountability. It means then that uh, the system, and I end the quote, uh, that we have labored under is no longer useful in terms of modern policing and standards of accountability. Uh, therefore, we bring this issue to fore here and now. Uh, it's vital for the county's residents to know that their public safety concerns have been heard. Uh, the people of Los Angeles County have expressed their views. They've uh, demanded more. And it's my view, Madam uh, Chair, members of the board, they deserve better. Uh, this does not supplant uh, their express view as is made clear at the at the voting box. It doesn't take away their right to vote. It essentially says explore what needs to be in place for our collective consideration and potentially for the consideration of the electorate. So it seems to me that this is time for us to move through uh, this decade of what has been uh, a rather remarkable degree of reform that has been advanced. And if we ultimately wish to make sure that public safety is real in the context of Los Angeles County, I believe we have to have more accountability, more transparency, and the exploration of how we get there through the potential removal of the sheriff, uh, should it be deemed appropriate, and or the very notion of an appointed sheriff or lead law enforcement officer rather than elected. Uh, Madam Chair, that's my opening uh, remarks. Uh, I'm open to further discussion and debate on the matter. It seems to me that it's clear that the time has come for us to move forward. Thank you. Supervisor Kuehl. Thank you very much, Madam Chair. Um, normally I would say, you know, I'm very pleased to co-author uh, a motion, et cetera, but um, this is a very different kind of motion. And I think it's important to emphasize that neither Supervisor Ruby Thomas, nor I, nor any of the others who have criticized the sheriff, take any pleasure in it. Uh, it it has become a, a somewhat of a sad situation. Uh, the media characterizes this as some kind of you know struggle or tip or argument or whatever, because I think it serves their purpose to make it sound like. Um, there's, uh, you know, credibility or some kind of a fight on both sides. So it's like, really quite different. We have had experience of this sheriff, this particular sheriff, since he was elected, and a couple of sheriffs before him. Um, and we are quite aware, uh, even some of us who were in Sacramento representing various parts of this county, of the actual good behavior uh, in which a sheriff can engage uh, in terms of their relationship with the board, in terms of their taking their budget seriously, in terms of being transparent, uh, in terms of, uh, you know, being forthcoming. Unfortunately, and I really mean that, this has not been the case with the current sheriff. Um, even uh, to the extent of telling uh, the medical examiner coroner, you know, not to release uh, the the results of an autopsy, um, and um, other ways in which we have not been able to get information 
uh, where subpoenas have been issued to the sheriff and simply been ignored, uh, where we have been castigated, um, you know, by him in his tweets. Um, it's uh, it's a pattern that actually felt kind of familiar, um, but um, one that we actually had to think about. And I think that's what this motion is about and would encourage all my colleagues to think of it that way. We are not taking an action in this motion. We are essentially asking in a situation where there is no adherence to the transparency needed in order to have any kind of oversight, where there is uh, a flaunting of subpoenas, where there is a castigation, and I mean even up to uh, engaging in name calling um, on the part of the sheriff, where, how it is we can maintain our duty to oversee uh, the budget of that department, uh, the treatment of employees in that department, and the safety of our constituents in all five districts. So this simply says, what are our options, if any, for removing or impeaching a sheriff? And we are not the first county to ask this question. Secondly, to really look at whether it might be um, a good idea uh, and one that would need to be agreed upon by all 58 counties, really, to look at uh, having an appointed sheriff. Thirdly, I find actually the most interesting, which is what legislative changes might be required for us to establish our own municipal police force. Every other of the 88 cities uh, who have uh, the ones of those that have their own police force um, hire the police chief and get to supervise the police chief. Um, it is not elected in any of our county, in any of our cities. Uh, and so um, in our municipal duties, I think it would be interesting to explore whether that might be a better idea for us, as well as uh, other kinds of services like court services, etc. So I um, agreed to co-author this motion, and I do believe that it is a very good action for the board to know and understand these kinds of options, uh, and um, am pleased to co-author. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Supervisor Hahn. Thank you, Madam Chair. So it, it's no secret that this board uh, does not see eye to eye with this particular sheriff. And uh, I do have to point out it's not for lack of trying because we really have tried from the very beginning. Uh, it seems like this sheriff has acted like he's not accountable to anyone but himself. And we have stepped in and we found ourselves stepping in again and again over the last two years to try and do what we can within our authority to achieve the kind of accountability that the public deserves. We do that because it's our job as elected officials to ensure our communities can trust the law enforcement entity that is sworn to serve and protect them. But ultimately, the sheriff is an elected official too. And the voters of LA County elected him for a four-year term. That doesn't mean he's there to stay. Being an incumbent doesn't guarantee anything. But currently, there's two ways that voters can remove the sheriff. They can recall him, or they can vote him out when his term is up. That's how democracy works. And I, with all due respect to my colleagues, I don't think it's our job to remove an elected officials an official. If the voters want to do that, it's totally within their right. And I absolutely don't support the way that this sheriff has dismissed the public's calls for accountability, transparency, and reform. And I hope he will listen seriously to these concerns instead of just responding defensively. And I think that the people who are pushing for this motion, even those who spoke during our public comment this morning, would have a very strong case for recalling them should they choose to bring that to the voters. But frankly, I think this motion is unnecessary. We know what the county charter says about our sheriff, and we know that it's not within this board's authority to remove an elected sheriff. 
we want to amend the charter we know what it takes we don't need a report back we just put measure j on the ballot to amend our charter and we could do the same thing here but we also know that the process is slow and probably wouldn't even be done before this sheriff is up for re-election. I think we're better off spending our time using our authority to continue to push for transparency, accountability, and reform. And if the voters want a new sheriff, they have their options. And I will tell you, all counties in California elect their sheriff. As we know, it's part of our state constitution, which would be something we would have to change. We already know that. But it's my experience that it is very, um, it is not acceptable to voters to take away a position where they have, they have history of electing. They don't like politicians to take that power from them. If they're used to electing the sheriff, they don't like the fact that we're going to remove that from them. So I'm going to vote no on this because I don't think it's necessary. I think we know what our options are if we want to change that. But I think the power lies with the people. And I think the people who elected this sheriff and are unhappy with this sheriff should do what they need to do to hold him accountable. And that's called an election. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Supervisor Solis. Yes, uh, thank you, Madam Chair. And um, I don't disagree with uh, my colleagues that this is probably one of the most important votes in front of us today. And that has to do with this sheriff or any other sheriff that we have here in Los Angeles. And it has become apparent and evident that we're dealing with an elected official who has, in my opinion, refused to collaborate and cooperate, not just with the board, with but also with other entities, you know, our inspector general, our civilian oversight, uh, a disrespect uh, for our our own um, directors for and CEOs for for LA County. And I, you know, I'm troubled by some of the statements that he's made. I understand that he wants to try to make amends, but I do think damage has been done. And I think you know the voters are very smart. Um, and I know that we're also entrusted to make some very hard decisions. And we know other entities have reported out their dissatisfaction also with his performance. But I, w I wanted to provide some context to what I believe is going on. And I did some of my own homework here because um, throughout the United States, we have a long history of electing sheriffs. In fact, 46 states elect sheriffs, and jurisdictions across the country have been rethinking the role and power of their sheriffs. All you have to do is look at what happened uh, in terms of uh, Arizona. Remember Sheriff Joe Arpaio and former Sheriff uh, David Clark in Milwaukee County, Wisconsin? These were sheriffs whose harmful and unethical behavior towards residents and incarcerated individuals made national headlines. Three states have never elected but appointed their sheriffs. Rhode Island, Hawaii, Alaska, and Connecticut joined the short list back in 1999 after decades of misconduct and abuse by a series of sheriffs. And there are also 13 counties in the U.S. that don't elect their sheriffs but are appointed, including Nassau and Westchester counties in New York. What we have seen is that there are elected sheriffs with unmatched autonomy and a real lack of accountability, even in jurisdictions that have oversight. Think of what is happening right here in LA County. Despite two oversight bodies, the Inspector General and Civilian Oversight Commission, the Sheriff continues to impede and thwart any resemblance of oversight or independent investigations into their operations. And there's recent research backed by trends that's showing that the unchecked power of the Sheriff is becoming more problematic and troubling. What we end up seeing and what we're dealing with now is someone with a tremendous amount of power and no accountability with how that power is utilized. We should not feel bound to continue a history of electing sheriff, sheriffs if it's not a, aligning with accountability and transparency. And it's unfortunate that we're at this impasse now. And we've heard calls for his resignation from the community and recently the Civilian Oversight Commission and we know, we all know that this is not a decision 
uh, that uh, is going to be lightly taken. Um, but I, I have come to, to this decision in this manner, and I would like to uh, present this uh, for consideration, and it's an amendment. Um, and I would like to have county council report back in writing and present to the board the options at the first board meeting on January 5th of 2021. The amended language would read as follows. Instruct acting county council in conjunction with the expect inspector general and acting chief executive officer in consult consultation with the executive director of civilian oversight commission and justice advocates to report back in writing and present to the board at the first board meeting on January 5th, 2021. And then the rest add the rest of the directors directives. It's important to me to make sure that options are shared with the board and with the public in community and open open public space, but also that the voters of Los Angeles um, have also recently voted to uh, allow for a fifth woman to join the Board of Supervisors. And what this report back will be will be able to do is help advise the new board, the new reconvening board, that I think will also come perhaps to the same conclusions, but be able to look at what options are there. And by waiting for the report back and accompanying presentation from the County Council on January 5th of 2021, we'll be able to do so with our supervisor-elect Holly Mitchell of Supervisora District 2 is a part of the LA County Board of Supervisors. I think that uh, moving ahead, we will all be able to work, I hope, together. Uh, but given the privileges, privileges that we have, I also think it's important because we are going to be constructing a new board and to have that voice also heard as well as the voice of our community, I think provides uh, better, better transparency for all of us. So I would, I would ask if the author and co-author would accept that friendly amendment. Thank you. Um, I, I just have to say, you know, this is a very interesting place for us all to be in concerning working relationships between the board and the sheriff. Sheriff Villanueva is independently elected and there have been many sheriffs before him, and there will be certainly many more who will follow. I will say it again, we cannot make long-term policy decisions based on the short-term personalities that be. I will also state again, um, I do believe that the actions of the current sheriff and the relationship with this board have been to the detriment of our deputies on the line who are serving all of our communities each and every day. I do not support many of the actions and have had significant concerns with his ability to appropriately lead our sheriff's department, but I do support the office. And more importantly, I support our personnel. As I stated before, the voters made their decision in 2018, and they will have another opportunity in 2022, unless there's a community-led effort to vacate that seat prior to the next election cycle. I encourage this sheriff to be transparent and collaborative with the OIG and the COC, and I am going to take him up on his offer to meet and move forward to address the needs of the department, especially as it relates to transparency. Our communities, and I'm hearing from them loud and clear, are sick of hearing about the disagreements and they're fed up with being used as a pawn. I looked to the Alcalina Sheriff Station, I looked to the Marina Del Rey Sheriff Station, I looked to our Parks Bureau, I looked at the host team. Each one of them, at one time or another, has been put on the chopping block, not based on what is right, but based on reactions to some of the things that they that the sheriff perceives our board has done we cannot continue relations as they currently exist and that is very clear our communities deserve better representation we are elected to collaborate as servants of the public and i for one and i told the sheriff this um, from day one while i didn't endorse him it does not mean i would not work with him and if i didn't work with people that did not endorse me when i first ran I would not be representing my constituency. We, we need, he needs to recognize that we as electeds all are in this together and we have a duty and obligation. And I believe that while this motion, I understand what you said, Supervisor Kuehl, regarding um, you know, opportunities and all, I believe this motion is based more on personality and not based on need. And I'm confident and I trust our voters as I did I did not endorse Measure J, but I honor the fact that Measure J passed based on the will of the voters. And I will do the same as it relates to an elected sheriff. If the voters believe that the, the individual that they vote for is the appropriate individual, 
I will support whomever receives the most votes. So I too am going to be voting no on this. Um, I appreciate what you all are saying, but I just believe that this is um, uh, unnecessary and quite frankly undermines the very democracy that we have in place, especially as elected officials um, moving forward. So with that, we have a, um, we have a motion before us and uh, Supervisor really Thomas, do you accept Supervisor Solis's amendment? I do. Okay, so item 16 as amended is before us. That'll be moved by Supervisor Ridley Thomas, seconded by Supervisor Kuehl to approve this item. Madam Executive Officer, please call the roll. Item 16 as amended is before you, Supervisor Solis. Aye. Supervisor Solis, aye. Supervisor Ridley Thomas. Aye. Supervisor Ridley Thomas, aye. Supervisor Kuehl. Aye. Supervisor Kuehl, aye. Supervisor Hahn. Oh. Supervisor Hahn, no. Supervisor Barger. No. Supervisor Barger, no. Motion carries three to two. Thank you. We are now. Thank Sorry, you. We're now going to... Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Supervisor Riley Thomas. Item number 23 is before us establishing an inclusive and transparent measure J revenue allocation process, which was held by Supervisor Kuehl. Thank you, Madam Chair. And thank you for mentioning uh, Measure J. Uh, in your last um, speech. Uh, I am really excited about this. Um, this is a joyful um, measure for me. I want to thank Supervisor Solis for co-authoring uh, item 23. Um, you know, we've been talking today a lot about the Care First Jail Last vision that we've all been working on and, and I think are justifiably proud about. But what we're celebrating today, or at least I am, is that the voters in L.A. County also said they're committed to that vision. Uh, they told us they want 10% of the funds. They agree that they contribute uh, in local revenue for the county to be reinvested right back into their communities, and they want those funds to provide uh, a, ver a variety of services and also alternatives to incarceration for their most vulnerable neighbors. Uh, now, that means we also need to fulfill the mandate that Measure J places on us as a board to, quote, establish an inclusive and transparent process on the allocation of funds. And that's what this motion does. Uh, first of all, it leans on the directors of our two transformative initiatives, Alternatives to Incarceration and the Anti-Racism, Diversity, and Inclusion Initiative to lead this process. Second, it sets forth a 17-member Reimagine LA Advisory Committee to bring together a diverse group of stakeholders, service providers, labor, criminal justice system impacted individuals, county department representatives, representatives of community-based or advocacy organizations, one each appointed by each of us, two labor reps, five individuals with lived experience or direct knowledge of the criminal justice system due to a family member's experience, including one with specific experience in the juvenile justice system. It also sets out uh, the notion of subcommittees so everybody can leverage their own expertise and add other people in to help with coming to these sets of recommendations. Um, so let me be clear, we're asking a lot of this advisory committee. It's not form over substance. It's not just complying with the mandate. This is about a real commitment to work on behalf of those who entrusted these funds to us. So we want them to use a lot of tools to encourage participation, community surveys, community listening sessions, stakeholder policy summits. Uh, we ask them to maintain a an emphasis on capacity building to help the county reimagine the way that we contract with community-based organizations. We want the committee to explore new opportunities for training and supporting community members so we can realize the goal we've been talking about for years of establishing pathways to high quality employment in the public and the private sectors to reestablish some economic stability. Uh, Clearly, the work has to be grounded in data and evaluation. And then, of course, we ask them to carry out their work 
with a racial, gender, and social equity lens. So it's a lot to ask. Why? Because there's a lot at stake. Because our CEO's preliminary estimate is that the Measure J allocation, which would really start in the next budget year, might be somewhere between 360 and 490 billion a year. Um, of course, I would like the higher end of that estimate, but you know, we'll be the ones to figure out what does it mean to be available as funding, and that's going to be up to the supervisors. But it's also a weighty responsibility for this committee to be purposeful and responsible, and the same for us. So I think that the Reimagine LA Advisory Committee, as envisioned in this motion, is the best way to achieve the responsibility placed upon us and to keep our promise to the voters. Um, I ask for your I vote, and I thank you all for your help in this large, large area of reform. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Supervisor Solis. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you, Supervisor Kuehl, for inviting me to co-author not only the motion, but the previous motions on Measure J. And as I've said in the past regarding the measure, let's let the voters decide. And guess what? They spoke. This is a victory that belongs to all the voters. The victory is one that LA County will benefit from greatly. And now I believe it's important that we as a board implement what the voters have asked us to do. And now that the county will be spending a minimum of 10% of its locally generated funds, we'll do so in a transparent and inclusive manner as evidenced by the motion. There is a great need in our communities. Just how the votes of this measure showed how we're handling people experiencing homelessness, people with mental illness, substance abuse disorders can no longer be the status quo. Should the motion pass, the first step is to establish a reimagined LA Advisory Committee, as was stated, to present to the board and how these precious funds can be used to help the most vulnerable in our communities. The committee is incredibly inclusive and it will have members representing the Office of Diversion and Reentry, Department of Mental Health, Department of Public Health, Substance Abuse Prevention and Control Program of the Department of Public Health, and we'll also have community-based advocacy members and, yes, our labor representatives, and most importantly, people who have been impacted by the criminal justice system. I believe that this is the best way to go, and I am very honored to have been a part in a short way of helping this move. And I'm also very excited because the beauty of, of this motion also is that at the top of the list is that it really does prioritize care first and jail last. And I know that we've all been working, the advocates, everyone has been working so hard to put forward a motion for a plan to close Men's Central Jail. And now we're moving on creating restorative care villages, not just at LAC USC, but other parts and around the county. And we're moving on building interim housing for people, one that's going to happen right here in my own district at the Vignes lot in Chinatown. So as we move forward, let's move together. So I ask also respectfully that, that you all, members of the board, vote for this. And I do have one question, Madam Chair, for our acting CEO, Fizia Davenport, if I might ask um, if she's available. Sure. Fizia? I'm here, Supervisor. Yes, thank you, Fija. I wanted to ask, I have been hearing that there have been several inquiries made about whether other municipalities, like the City of Los Angeles, would be able to receive some portion of Measure J funds. Can you please clarify and elaborate? Yes, uh, thank you, Supervisor, for that question. Um, I do think that there is uh, sometimes a misperception um, for some that Measure J represents uh, like a new tax that is bringing in new revenue to the County of Los Angeles. Uh, but I think we all know in the county that that is not the case. Uh, what Measure J does is it allows us to take our existing revenue and then set 10% of that aside for direct community investments and for alternatives to incarceration. The motion is very specific and very clear as to what those community investments look like. A lot of them are um, invested in community-based organizations as well as uh, the community-based service delivery model. And the same is true for investments in alternatives to incarceration, 
Uh, many of those investments are focused on community-based uh, health services and community-based diversion and reentry programs. To the extent that um, I think the motion is very clear as to the types of investments, uh, the Measure J funds, uh, it would be a mistake for other uh, municipalities uh, to look at this as a potential revenue source uh, for them. I think the motion is very clear uh, that that this these funds really should be focused on community-based services, as well as as well as some of the existing services uh, provided by the county. But again, those services would be directed to alternatives to incarceration, diversion and reentry programs, employment, access to capital for uh, African American businesses, and things of that nature. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank Madam. you, Supervisor Hahn. Hey, Madam Chair. Uh, well, I just wanted to weigh in, uh, like everybody, and thank Supervisor Kuehl, Supervisor Solis for this motion, and as well as your your work on uh, getting Measure J to the ballot. What a great time this is! And here's a perfect example of uh, you know the people of LA County. Uh, bringing us a charter amendment uh, that they felt long term would really uh, change the, the the course of, of human behavior in 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 this county, uh, and the voters agreed and voted decisively to move uh, our county towards the care first, jail last vision that we have had on this board. Our budget is certainly a statement of our values, and with Measure J, voters said that LA County values mean providing treatment over a jail cell, housing over homelessness, and jobs over poverty. I've been truly moved and humbled by the political engagement and activism that we have seen over the last few months from our communities all across our county. And passage of Measure J was an important step towards upending the status quo. But our work is not done. Uh, so thank you uh, for envisioning a Reimagine LA Advisory Committee and putting this on our agenda today because we know this will help establish a transparent and inclusive process for determining how the 10% allocation will be spent. Uh, Measure J was put on the ballot because of the people and it was passed by the people. So we need to make sure that the money allocation process continues to be driven by the people. And I believe this advisory committee will get us there. I'm proud to support this motion today. Um, and it's really amazing with all the stress that the country uh, kind of went through last week. It was really felt good that here in LA County, we were decisive about our future and the direction we wanted to go in. Thanks to everyone out there um, who helped get out the vote. And thanks to all the LA County voters who turned up in record numbers to tell us that it's time to reimagine our LA County budget. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Supervisor Hahn. Madam Chair, if I may. Supervisor Ridley Thomas. Thank you very much, um, Madam Chair and Supervisor Kuehl. We thank you for your leadership uh, and initiation of the effort in this regard. Uh, the voters of L.A. County, uh, once again, uh, have shown themselves to be ahead of the rest of the nation with their support for greater investments in community well-being, as they did when they voted for um, Measure H in 2017, uh, Measure W just a few years after. Uh, and today, uh, voters in LA counties and across the nation are sending a clear message that it's time for change. It's an unmistakably clear message. And under Measure J, uh, this board can now continue to shift the county away from punitive approaches and create the model for true criminal justice reform that reflects the needs, the values, and the priorities of the residents of this county. The collection and analysis of population data uh, will be uh, critical to this vision and the advancement of the county's anti-racist policy agenda, Madam Chair and members of the board. Uh, 
the stakeholders who participated in the process of developing the ATI roadmap wisely recognized the value of using data uh, to ensure all Measure J investments effectively responded to the community needs and promoted racial equity. To achieve this goal, it's critical that we maintain an inclusive process of allocating Measure J funds that adequately accounts for the painful reality of the racial inequality underlying the need for these very investments. So my amending motion seeks to align Measure J funding allocations with data that shows uh, that African Americans are disproportionately affected by the most punitive aspects of criminal justice um, work, um, uh, the criminal justice system itself. Uh, some of those data points uh, were included in my motion from July to establish an anti-racist policy agenda for the county. And my amending uh, motion here also addresses a directive from the July motion that request an, al an annual update on the state of black Los Angeles County from the Human Relations Commission and a local academic and research institution. The University of California at Los Angeles, uh, Black Male Institute, the Charles R. Drew University of Medicine and Science, and the University of Southern California are well positioned with the local expertise, research capacity, and community-based partnerships to satisfy the county's ongoing need for specific hyperlocal actionable data and uh, to help us reimagine Los Angeles County. Thank you, Madam Chair, and I respectfully request uh, uh, the adoption of the amendment in consultation with the author of the motion, and I appreciate such consideration. Does the author of the motion accept the friendly amendment? Yes. Great. All right. So I'm 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 just going to make my comments short. And I, I I agree. I mean, the voters have spoken clearly on their desire to have this board allocate a minimum of 10 percent of our general fund dollars to further invest in a community based system of care and alternatives to incarceration. As I said all along, it's never been an either or for me. This board has consistently invested and, and will now continue at a minimum of 10 percent um, across the board for just these type of services. I appreciate the efforts by my colleagues, Supervisor Kuehl and Solis, to get the ball rolling and making this process both transparent and practical. The more we discuss the ATI recommendations and Measure J allocations, the more I've come to realize that the overwhelming alignment with the transformation of Challenger probation camps in Lancaster, something we're looking at, moving it from a probation camp into something that is truly going to be transformational not only for Challenger, but for the people that come in contact with the services that are going to be provided. This facility will require some capital investments in order to serve in its new capacity as a restorative care village in the woefully underserved region of the Antelope Valley. Both Palmdale and Lancaster have been listed amongst the top five cities, spending far more to incarcerate than to provide services as part of UCLA's Million Dollar Hoods report. I want to take this opportunity to highlight this project and the significant impact that it will have on this community in particular. I would also like to restate my commitment to equitable services throughout the county, starting with our highest need regions. We have significant opportunities here to transform lives for generations to come. This advisory committee will be key in forging a path for investment in our communities, and I do truly look forward to success to come. So with that, um, Madam Executive Officer, it will be moved by Supervisor Kuehl, Second by Supervisor Solis, would you please call the roll? As amended. Item 23 as, as amended. amended. Item 23 as amended. Supervisor Solis. Aye. aye. Supervisor Solis, aye. Supervisor Riley Thomas. Aye. Supervisor Riley Thomas, aye. Supervisor Kuehl. Aye. Supervisor Kuehl, aye. Supervisor Hahn. Aye. Supervisor Hahn, aye. Supervisor Barger. Aye. Supervisor Barger, aye. Motion carries five to zero. Thank you. We are now moving on to item 24, establishing a county of Los Angeles, lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, queer, and questioning business program. It was held by Supervisor Kuehl. That was very well announced, Madam Chair. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank um, you. Really, I'm serious. Um, 
I, I'm really grateful to the Department of Consumer and Business Affairs and to the Internal Services Department for all the work that they put in to the excellent report back that we got um, just last month that so clearly outlined the recommendations on how to move the effort uh, represented in this motion forward. A thank you also to Supervisor Solis for being our co-author on this motion, as well as to the motion that we brought in August of 2019 asking that we take a look at our contracting with community business enterprise firms policy, the CBE policy, to clarify that it is inclusive of LGBTQ plus owned firms and to ensure that the county's formal contractor outreach programs are inclusive of these populations as well. Uh, you know, a lot of people don't know, and uh, it's not as clear to people, that people in the LGBTQ plus community do experience disproportionate rates of poverty and homelessness and discrimination in employment and in the workplace, which can destabilize their housing and make it more unaffordable. They uh, face widespread harassment and discrimination uh, by housing providers as well. They're also significantly impacted by justice and child welfare systems, owing in large part to systemic oppression, as well as individual action resulting from conditioned bias. A considerable percentage of our youth experiencing homelessness identify as LGBTQ, between 20 and 45 percent, according to the Williams Institute. Family rejection of LGBTQ plus youth is a major factor, factor contributing to high levels of homelessness. And uh, as we found in a survey uh, of our foster uh, kids, um, although LGBTQ young people maybe are five, six, seven percent of the population, uh, over 20 percent of our foster kids and foster youth identify as LGBTQ. So all of that to say that my community as well continues to come up against barriers that have a lot of impact on their well-being and ability to thrive. So this motion is a, a really good step, a small step, but a good step to um, acknowledge those barriers and uh, try to do what we can to help alleviate some of them so that we're not overlooking our own um you know, failure to take it into account. The pandemic has deepened the need to uplift our residents who already faced significant obstacles, especially in our business communities in non-COVID times. And a lot of people on the margins are hurting right now financially, and it ripples out to every aspect of life. So creating an LGBTQ plus owned business designation under the umbrella of the CBE program will increase our contracting and subcontracting opportunities for this historically disadvantaged population. I'm very grateful uh, for your consideration of this initiative because I believe it will benefit uh, a large number of our constituents. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Supervisor Sol uh, Solis. Yes, just briefly, thank you, Madam Chair, and also a big shout out to Supervisor Kuehl for inviting me to be co-author on this motion. You know, the board is recognizing the importance of the county's spending power, and as Supervisor Kuehl said, we have taken many actions to ensure that businesses owned by women, minorities, disabled veterans, and other groups have full and equal access to county procurement and contracting opportunities. But the board has yet to explicitly include LGBTQQ individuals in its contracting equity programs. So today, through this motion, the board will proudly create an LGBTQQ owned business designation under the umbrella of the Community Business Enterprise Program. The COVID-19 pandemic has exposed and deepened social and economic inequalities for this community. This motion is especially urgent during this time of crisis, and this community stands to benefit greatly from its inclusion in the DCBA's Community Business Enterprise Program. And as we all know, while Proposition 16 did get a majority of the votes in LA County, it did not receive sufficient votes needed throughout the state. That's why it's even more important now than ever for the county to incentivize marginalized small businesses. Thank you, and I hope our colleagues will join us in passing this motion. Thank you, Madam Chair. 
Thank you. Uh, seeing that no one else requested to speak on this item, it is moved by Supervisor Kuehl, seconded by Supervisor Solis. Madam Executive Officer, please take the roll. Item 24 is before you. Supervisor Solis? Aye. Supervisor Solis, aye. Supervisor Riley Thomas? Supervisor Riley Thomas? Supervisor Kuehl? Aye. Supervisor Kuehl, aye. Supervisor Hahn? Aye. Supervisor Hahn, aye. Supervisor Barger? Aye. Supervisor Barger, aye. Motion carries four to zero. Supervisor Ridley Thomas, are you on? Okay, we will move on to item number 25, updating the county eviction moratorium in light of Assembly Bill 3033 and federal eviction. And this was held by Supervisor Kuehl. Uh, thank you very much, Madam Chair. Quickly, um, we're pretty clear now that COVID-19 has created kind of a perfect storm for all of our struggling renters in the county. Uh, hundreds of thousands of county households continuously face eviction because of their inability to pay rent and, you know, their reduced income makes it very, very difficult. At the same time, we've actually seen that a majority of renters continue to pay some or all of their rent. And so that says a lot about the integrity of our local renters. But unfortunately, no matter how we try, the virus has forced us to be cautious about reopening our economy. And many people are still out of work or uh, suffering reduced hours. And while the board usually uh, considers moratorium extensions on a month to month basis, I think it's important this time to uh, consider a two month extension through the end of January, given the, the uh, really sharp surge we've seen in COVID cases, but also the upcoming holidays because of our own uh, break and the inability for us to take an action uh, to extend the moratorium in uh, December because we uh, we may be gone, or if not gone, at least not meeting. Uh, so I hope that we agree that no one should be threatened with eviction or made homeless and uh, that it would be good to extend these protections. Let me say a little bit about AB 3088, uh, which protects residential tenants and mobile home space renters from eviction if they're unable to pay the rent between March 1st, 2020 and January 31st, 2021. Um, we had already adopted protections, but um, as of October 1st, the county was preempted from continuing our local non-payment protections because they were replaced by, uh, by that bill, by AB 3088. So under the county's non-payment protections, our tenants had 12 months after the end of the moratorium to repay back rent, but under AB 3088, tenants must pay a quarter of their monthly rent starting October 1st. Um, so of course we are uh, uh, needing to obey the state law, uh, but the county's other tenant protections can remain in effect so long as the board continues to extend our eviction moratorium. And that includes protections from no-fault evictions unauthorized occupants, pets, and nu nuisances. Uh, so I ask for your I vote. I think it's important to continue this through the end of January. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Supervisor Kuehl. Seeing that no one else has requested to speak on this no. item. Madam Chair? Madam Chair? Yes. Just briefly, I just want to really commend Supervisor Kuehl on inviting me to join her on this motion. I think it's very clear to us right now, we are still in this pandemic and we still need to provide eviction protections for many, many of our families. Our communities, especially in the first district, have been very hard hit. It's hard enough just to put food on the table, but then to try to make rent. We have to continue the extension of our eviction moratorium now more than ever. And as already explained by Supervisor Kuehl, we're merely aligning where we can with the state legislation. So I would ask for uh, an I vote on this. Thank you very much. Thank you. Sorry about that, Supervisor Solis. Moved by Supervisor Kuehl, seconded by Supervisor Solis. Madam Executive Officer, please call the roll. Item 25 is before you. Supervisor Solis? Aye. Supervisor Solis, aye. Supervisor Ridley Thomas? Supervisor Kuehl? 
Aye. Supervisor Kill, aye. Supervisor Hahn? Aye. Aye. Supervisor Hahn, aye. Supervisor Barger? Aye. Supervisor Barger, aye. Motion carries four to zero. Thank you. Item 30 is the next agenda item, but that was held with Vice President Ridley Thomas, who is stepped out of the meeting. So we will continue that to the end of the board meeting and move on to item number 55, report on compliance with the ROSIS agreement. And at this point, um, we've got a presentation by the Sheriff's Department as well, personnel. And um, I think each one of my colleagues may want to say something, but um, why don't we go ahead and uh, invite assess, uh, Assistant Sheriff Bruce Chase, Commander Sergio Alamo, Alama, and Captain Larry Alva, Sheriff's Department, to present a report. Are they on? I, uh, thank you, Madam Chair. This is Assistant Sheriff Chase. Can you guys hear me? Yes, welcome. Okay. okay. Yeah, thank you, and, and also the other honorable members of the board. Uh, as you're all aware, Provision 1.4 of the ROSIS uh, Settlement Agreement requires us to publicly report twice a year to the board on certain areas relating to compliance with the agreement. So, and I'll also have uh, Captain Larry Alva and some members of his staff here with me. Uh, Commander Aloma uh, had to step out, unfortunately. So, uh, those guys have day-to-day -day responsibility for overseeing compliance. So, I'll have them here in case there are any detailed questions. Uh, this will be the first time we've presented on this matter under the remote meeting protocols. So I just want to remind the public that the PowerPoint presentation, which would normally be displayed during our open discussion at the hall, is still available to members of the public uh, via the board's website. Uh, in the interest of respecting everyone's time, we've also been asked to try and keep our presentation time to 15 minutes. Uh, so with the board's permission, I'll try to hit just the highlights of each slide uh, and then allow for questions from any of the supervisors uh, who may have uh, specific areas of concern. That'd be great. Thank you. All right. Yeah, and some of the areas may also overlap with information already discussed during Mr. Drian's earlier presentation on DOJ. Uh, and I'd also like to take the time to join and echo the board's comments uh, thanking Mr. Drian for working with us over the years. Uh, I had the pleasure of meeting him first during the Citizens Commission on Jail Violence when I was assigned to the Commander Management Task Force. So our relationship went back a number of years. Uh, and he, he will be missed, but we look forward to working with the new monitor. I believe the members of the board have had time to review the presentation as well and are also aware of the historical information presented on the first few slides. So if it's agreeable, I'll proceed directly to slide four, uh, where we begin the overview of the current status of compliance detailed in the seventh report uh, in comparison to the sixth report. So as you can see, uh, in the seventh report, we're uh, compliant with 83 of the 104 provisions uh, we were found non-compliant with uh, 15 of the provisions that we're still working on. Four of those relate to use of force, uh, two of them to training, three of them to force reporting and investigations, three of them to grievance, two of them to the use of restraints, uh, and one to the early warning system where we're still working. Uh, two of the assessments are still pending, uh, and four were found not to be, not to be applicable uh, to this uh, reporting periods assessment. So we had uh, uh, some good improvement over the sixth period where uh, we were compliant with only 51 of the provisions, so now we're up to uh, 83. Moving on to the next slide, uh, which discusses the update on the jail use of force training. Uh, we continue to make progress. Uh, the limitations, uh, under the current uh, requirements due to the pandemic, though, we've had to scale back some of the training. So you'll see that our numbers uh, went down in the uh, seventh reporting period uh, once we had the uh, county and state emergencies declared in the beginning of March. Uh, we've had to limit the size uh, and scope of some of the training classes. But we do continue to uh, push forward, uh, and the, the numbers speak for themselves. So we. Uh, we're committed to uh, 
making sure we, we stay in compliance. Uh, and we've also worked with the monitors. They're aware of the limitations, you know, that COVID has put on us. Uh, so we continue to move forward. Uh, the next slide deals with the uh, overall use of force statistics comparing the first six months of 2019 to the first six months of 2020, which is the seventh reporting period. And you can see that uh, we actually had some success uh, with overall force decreasing uh, by 35%. Our NCIs decreased by 41%. Our CAT 1s decreased by 29%. The CAT 2s went down 49%. Uh, and the cat threes went up 100%, but that was from two to four, so it wasn't a significant uh, significant increase. Uh, the next slide just details the breakdown of category one force incidents. So as you can see in the first quarter uh, of 2019, it was 214, and in the first quarter of 2020, it was 167. Uh, in the first quarter of 2019, or second quarter of 2019, excuse me, 215 versus 136 um, in the second quarter of 2020, uh, for a total of uh, you know decreasing from 429 to 303. And so it's it, it's worth noting also that some of the uh, decrease can be attributable to the decompression and the depopulation uh, due to the, the onset of the pandemic, but also it's important to remember that the uh, first three months, January, February, and March, uh, there wasn't uh, the decompression uh, completed, and it took us a couple months into the uh, into the semester to get down to the 12,000. Uh, and I know uh, Mr. Drew had touched on that 12,000 figure that we can discuss after we're finished with the presentation, but uh, you know, unfortunately right now we're back up uh, as of this morning uh, closer to 15,000. The next uh, slide just breaks down category two uses of force, uh, and again, where we had considerable success in lowering the numbers. Uh, the first quarter, it was 87 in 2019 and compared to 48 in the first quarter of 2020. And in the second quarter, 68 in 2019 versus 30 in 2020. Uh, so. It's uh, almost a 50% increase, decrease. The category three uses of force in the downtown jail complex. So again, in 2019, we only had two. Uh, in 2020, we had four. Uh, however, uh, none of the incidents involved uh, significant injury. Uh, just two of them involved uh, fights in our open yard on the 3,000 roof with some of our our K-10s or our serious and, and most serious and violent offenders that were engaged in assaulting each other, uh, where deputies employed uh, FN-303 pepper ball rounds from a considerable distance away uh, in order to try and stop them from assaulting each other. Uh, and so in two of those instances, uh, inmates were, were struck uh, with superficial injuries to their heads. Uh, so those uh, bumped them up to category three. Uh, we had another takedown where an individual was was taken down to the floor and, and in the process uh, his head hit the floor. So uh, erring on the side of caution, we made that a category three. So it would also be investigated by our uh, internal affairs force rollout team. Uh, and then one other instance where individual was taken to the floor and he ended up uh, sustaining a broken rib. So uh, there was some possibility that was part of a prior injury, uh, but just again, erring on the side of caution, we bumped it up to a category three. So some of our, our force mitigation efforts that we think might be contributing to the decrease in force. Uh, we continue weekly uh, the chiefs, uh, both division chiefs, have weekly meetings uh, that involve the units, the unit commanders, the training staff, uh, as well as uh, um, representatives from the Office of Inspector General. Uh, so those occur weekly. Uh, we also have an employee review system that has a use of force component. So our early warning system uh, came into play. We've we implemented some new training methods. Uh, 
pushing out videos. We had our, our training bureau push out uh, short videos so that we could we could have deputies view, uh, you know, at their workstations. So in addition to briefings uh, before they begin their shifts, uh, they can also be directed to watch short videos. Uh, and those things, uh, we've found them helpful. We've streamlined the inmate uh, grievance, or we're, we're in the process of trying to streamline the inmate grievance uh, investigation process. Uh, so uh, we're, that's a work in pro progress where we want to be able to standardize it so we can have um, have it searchable and more easily queried so that we can uh, get to the root of problems uh, more quickly rather than having it in a narrative form where we may, might not become aware of patterns of complaints or behavior. <clears throat> uh, and we've also been actively working with partnering with Correctional Health Services on, on how to track the progress on medical complaints uh, because once a, a complaint is uh, deemed to be medical in nature, it reverts over to uh, CHS to handle, uh, and we hadn't previously had a good uh, system for reconciling whether they've been handled to conclusion uh, based on some of the medical privacy rights that come into play. The next uh, slide is an update on administrative investigation violations on a use of force policy. Uh, in January of the first uh, six months of 2019, you can see we initiated uh, five cases. Uh, four of those cases uh, were closed and one is still pending. Uh, those cases resulted in discipline ranging from Written reprimand, written reprimands to uh, 20 days off. So for the first six months of uh, of 2020, we've also initiated five cases, and all five cases are still currently under investigation. Uh, and we also closed uh, one additional case out in the first six months of 2020 that was from the prior quarter, and it was also a founded investigation. Uh, an update on administrative investigations, which I know you guys also discussed uh, with Mr. Druyan. So in uh, 2020, as you can see, uh, we've actually initiated 64 investigations in custody as opposed to 44 the previous year. Uh, so they've increased by 45% for the first, uh, first six months of 2020. The next slide deals with the inmate grievances. Uh, so in 2019, uh, in the first six months, there were uh, 3,510 uh, general grievances and another 323 against staff and almost a million and a half iPad requests. Uh, and in 2020, uh, general grievances went up slightly to 3,600 plus. Uh, with 30, 388 uh, complaints against uh, those complaints against staff, uh, and iPad requests had actually gone down slightly to uh, just over 1.3 million. The top five. The next slide. The top five grievances. So in 2019, uh, the top grievance fell into the other category, uh, whereas in 2020, the top uh, grievance was on living conditions. And, and I also noted that the top five uh, grievances in 2019 uh, accounted for about 50% of the total grievances, uh, whereas the top five grievances in 2020 accounted for closer to 80% of the grievances. Uh, we believe uh, that this is primarily uh, associated with some of the living conditions uh, and restrictions that uh, we had to implement due to the COVID pandemic. Uh, you know, we had to cancel most programming and, and public visitation has still not, in-person in public visitation has still not been allowed. Uh, so that actually accounted for a lot of the, uh, the grievances. Uh, 
and and we're working on it. So we're we're trying to keep things, uh, you know, as the living conditions as best we can. And so actually getting these grievances uh, helps us to react and see where we can improve conditions uh, for the inmates to to the extent that we can, uh, where it's under our control. And so that actually uh, uh, concludes the actual slideshow presentation. So now I'd be happy to try and answer any specific questions any of the supervisors might have. Sure. First of all, thank you for that presentation. We appreciate it. And I know Supervisor Hahn had some questions for you. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, yeah, I mean, overall, it was encouraging to hear uh, Richard Druin's comments about big picture uh, use of force has gone down in our jails and even he I think even attributed that to just an overall culture change which certainly uh, we like hearing um, and that's the use of force number is the one that I really appreciate that has decreased um, what I was going to ask it still seems like there's 15 provisions that that you're not in compliance with. Um, I realize that that's down from the numbers in the last report, so that's progress. That still seems like a lot of provisions that you're not compliant with. And just kind of give us a, an idea, why are you still out of compliance? And how are you planning to come into compliance? Thank you. Yeah, of course. So. Um... There are some uh, struggles with the uh, the rate of compliance and how they're, they're measured, uh, particularly with uh, some of the subjective uh, provisions. So uh, we meet with the monitors regularly. So like uh, most of them pertain to the uh, use of force is where use of force and use of force reporting would, would account for the most. And that's where we're, we're in compliance with, with many of the force provisions. and. And, and we all have uh, benefited from uh, the culture change. Uh, it's beneficial for the, the individuals that are incarcerated. It's also beneficial for all the county employees and, and other independent contractors that come in and out of our facilities. Uh, but uh, they also you know, hold us to a, a pretty high standard, and, and rightfully so, so that we're, uh, you know, we're working on the training for our folks uh, you know, we have a lot of turnover. We have the new people coming in, uh, so that's where the training uh, comes in. I know Mr. Drian talked about uh, his concerns with some of the uh, personal weapons and the head strikes. So that's actually something we've recently discussed with the monitors. Uh, so for the Rosas panel, uh, we just had a, a one of their review processes where they come in and review. Uh, uses of force that they have some concerns with either the way the force was uh, was initiated or and or the way it was investigated uh, and it gives us uh, a good uh, look at what we need to improve on and one of the things is personal weapons where we're now looking at uh, changing our policy to be more specific as Mr. Drian uh, talked about where I, I almost consider it uh, akin to to the sea change we had uh, when we removed flashlights from the jails back in 2011, 2012, where everybody thought that was, uh, you know, going to cause uh, all sorts of problems for our deputies and and everything was going to fall apart, and it just didn't happen. It, it ended up uh, being one of the best things that that could have happened uh, for everyone's uh, safety, and we're able to modify the way we we handled situations and the way force was applied. Uh, and it has prevented uh, serious injuries over the years to staff and to inmates. Uh, I think that's where we are now with kind of the personal weapons where, where he had some concerns about uh, what he called unprovoked uh, uh, strikes. Uh, but from our personnel standpoint, sometimes they feel it's generally a point where they feel uh, that they're imminently in danger of being assaulted. Uh, and obviously we don't want to take away anybody's uh, ability to defend themselves and we don't want to create an unsafe environment, uh, but that's where I, I liken it to the flashlight dilemma. 
uh, deputies at the time were thinking that there's no way they could safely execute their their duties uh, without flashlights, and we've we've showed them that we can, uh, and now I think we'll be able to uh, show them the same uh, path with uh, head strikes with personal weapons, which more often than not tend to uh, injure our personnel uh, as well. And so that's that's just where I think we have some of the biggest struggles. Uh, but it's not something we're not going to be able to overcome. I hope I didn't go on too too long there. No, Supervisor Hahn. Thank you. I'm done. Okay. <laughs> no, you did not do any of my call. Anyone else have any questions? Hearing none, we want to thank you for that report. Um, we appreciate it and. Uh, I think that will be it, unless you have anything else to add before we vote on it. Uh, no, that's all I have. Thank you all very much. Thank you, Assistant Sheriff Chase. Item 55 is before us. I will move seconded by Supervisor Hahn to receive and file the report. If there are no objections, that will be the order. Now we're going to move on to item 60, the settlement of the matter entitled Ryan Charles Twyman at all versus County of Los Angeles, which was held by Supervisor Ridley Thomas. So Ridley Thomas, are you there? Okay, then we are gonna move on to item 65A, Registrar Recorder Clerk Posting Post-Election Briefing. It's a, a report by Dean. Dean, are you available? Can I? Yeah, thanks. Yes, yes, um, yes, yes. Let, me, let me just start off by saying um, thank you to every voter in the county who exercised their right to vote in this past election. We had the highest number of votes cast ever in the county, and for that, uh, we should be proud. Um, and let me just start uh, before Dean gets on to say, you know, the primary in March did not go uh, as well as uh, we had all hoped for. But I really wanted to take this opportunity to give credit to our County Registrar, Dean Logan, who took all the feedback in March. Um, and by the way, that feedback uh, lasted throughout the summer, and it actually lasted up uh, until the week before um, this election date. And he listened to everybody. He took time to be on calls with us. He took time to be on calls with constituents. Um, and he did something about the things that went wrong. Uh, and I will say that the primary in March and this general election were like night and day. First, we sent a ballot to every registered voter and vote by mail was used in record numbers. Official drop boxes were installed around the county and more voters returned their ballots there than used the post office. And for those voters that showed up in person at vote centers, they were greeted with well-trained election workers, many of whom were county employees. The long lines that had plagued vote centers in March were non-existent in October and November. Uh, I visited several vote centers in my district, and I know my colleagues, you uh, talked about how you did the same, and you talked to voters, and you talked to election workers, and we all had the same uh, experience. Most people, workers, staff, and the voters said it was a good experience. In fact, some of them said it was the best experience they'd ever had. And so I just wanted to give um, our Registrar Recorder, Dean Logan, a chance to talk to us a little bit about how this past election went, uh, what were some of the policies that made the difference, and I'm hopeful that uh, March was really just a hiccup and that our elections moving forward will be as smooth as this one. But I believe uh, thanks and congratulations all around for Dean Logan, uh, job well done. And uh, I really appreciated you. And I don't know if some of my colleagues wanted to say something first, but I know you have a quick uh, post-election update to give us, Dean. Thanks. 
Great. Thank, thank you so much. Um, thank you, Madam Chair and Supervisors, and thank you, Supervisor Hahn, for, for those comments. I, I really appreciate that, and I uh, want to congratulate um, the county as a whole for the successful election. Uh, this, is, this is the type of thing that cannot happen without uh, the full support and cooperation of um, an army of people, and that really is what it took in this case to to get the job done. So, um, really appreciate that. Uh, you touched on on a lot of things I was going to say, and I know it's been a long meeting. I, I think there is there is a lot to to report on, and we are still in the midst of the uh, certification of this election. It's it's hard to believe it's it's only been a week since election day, but um, but that is that is the case. So we're 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 continuing. So let me try to just briefly touch on some some high points, and then. Um, if there are any questions. Uh, you know, when we started 2020, we were in a very different situation than we are now. We were at the beginning of 2020, uh, legacy voting systems in California, including the, the IncaVote system that, that LA County had been using for decades were decertified. Um, and there was a requirement under um, state regulations for us to uh, implement our new voting system, something that we've been working on for uh, well over a decade here. Uh, we faced new threats and challenges related to cybersecurity that that had not um, at certainly at a level that we had not experienced before. We faced the acceleration of the presidential primary, which moved from the traditional date of June to March. Um, and then we had a series of changes in election laws to implement. So we had here in L.A. County a, a change in the order of the ballot in a presidential year. Uh, we had an, an expansion of the California's conditional voter registration law that would allow voters to register and vote um, leading up to and on election day at any voting location uh, in the state. Um, and we had the Voters' Choice Act, which was really the uh, enabling legislation that um, aligned to the Voting Solutions for All People initiative that we had been working on um, for, for implementation in 2020. And then finally, um, 2020 was the first election year under the new election consolidation law where our municipal and special district elections were consolidated uh, almost in every case onto the even year election ballot. So our ballot um, that we had last week was a very long ballot that included everything from the very local, the most local of contests and measures and governing bodies all the way up to uh, president of the United States. So it was a, it was a complex ballot in that sense. As Supervisor Hahn uh, mentioned, uh, we, we unveiled a lot of this in the March 2020 uh, presidential primary and it was a, it was a tough time and we, we faced capacity issues. We faced some technical execution issues, logistical issues, and we lacked the, the data and the predictive analytics about voter behavior that um, that were critical to and proved critical to the success uh, that we had last week. Uh, so when I uh, appeared before you to do a post-election briefing on March 10th, it's, it was very different than it is today on uh, November 10th. But uh, at that meeting, uh, I asserted to your board that the VSAP, the Voting Solutions for All People model, was a sound model and that our long-term investment and hard work in LA County uh, was was worth the continued uh, effort and, and believed that we could demonstrate that that was a sound model. I also made a commitment to you to identify and address the deficiencies in the March election and to improve the process. Um, and then days later, uh, COVID-19 uh, set in, and that changed the environment in which we had to um, look at conducting the general election. So in April, we did a report back to your board. It was a comprehensive review or audit of the March election. Uh, it was a very candid and transparent assessment. Uh, it included a detailed action plan with timelines and recommendations, um, 12 key milestones, 53 critical tasks, and over 160 detailed subtasks that that proved to be the roadmap that we used to approach the November election. And I'm pleased to report to you that all of those milestones, tasks, and subtasks were completed for the general election, um, with few exceptions that, that are carryover items that are, that are longer term uh, efforts that we need to work through uh, here in the county. We also had the opportunity to conduct um, some special elections in April and, and May. Um, in the early days of the uh, public health orders um, around COVID-19 and, and use that as an opportunity to figure out how are we gonna do this on a large scale where there were restrictions on public gatherings and uh, the need for social distancing and PPE and all of those things that um, 
just were, were, were new, new challenges on top of the challenges that we already faced in, in a presidential election cycle. So we focused on, on a number of key areas, and um, I'm just going to touch on a few of them. It was already referenced that um, that, that probably the the underlying reform or change for the November election that was so key was the expansion of vote by mail, where we mailed ballots to every registered voter in the county. Pivotal in that, um, from my perspective, was the early adoption uh, by your board. Uh, you made a decision very early on um, after the primary and after the onslaught of COVID to uh, to take that action that enabled us to build that into our plan uh, from day one for the general election. That included things like uh, doing countywide mailings to inform voters of the change, um, orienting voters to services like ballot tracking that proved to be very uh, beneficial and, and um, a feature that many voters enjoyed. The reference to the official vote by mail drop boxes uh, turned out to be a phenomenal uh, element of this election. We we placed 404 of those secure official drop boxes throughout the county, and over 53% of the vote by mail ballots that were returned came back through those boxes. Um, but we also had to look at new facilities and new staffing models because that was a different model of of conducting elections. We already, even prior to this election, uh, we were the largest um, volume of vote by mail activity in the country, and for us, adding the additional voters to that list. Um, was really the equivalent of adding the, the size of Orange County on top of what we already had done for vote by mail. So uh, a lot of effort that had to go into that, including looking at the three throughput modeling and projection of how are we going to be sure that we uh, keep production going and that those ballots get counted and, and reported in a timely manner. Uh, beyond the, the expansion of vote by mail, uh, we took a hard look at our organizational capacity, made some significant changes to our structure in the department, brought on some senior leadership and operational oversight um, that was key to uh, holding us accountable to that action plan and that roadmap. Um, we had a number of things to address and improve with regard to technology. So the electronic poll books that were first used in, in March um, where we had some issues. We, we went back and we held uh, the vendor and ourselves accountable to improving that system. We partnered with AT&T on the connectivity issue to ensure that we had a solid plan that was well tested uh, going into the, the general election. Uh, the ballot marking devices, which are the key element of the in-person voting experience, uh, were um, refined. Uh, specific issues around um, the, the the ballot path and uh, uh, usability issues, the the more button um, that we that we heard about in the primary, those were addressed. We took that back through state certification with the Secretary of State, which included third-party uh, testing, review of the code, security testing, um, and really rigorous testing. Uh, I, I believe um, more uh, intense testing of a voting system than than I've ever seen in my 30 plus years in elections administration. And, and I say that with pride because I think that's important for us to be able to say that our voting system withstood that, that scrutiny and that type of testing. Um, then we looked at some voter tools to add to the the mix for based on what we what we learned in the early part of of this year, including adding a a vote center wait time monitor on our website so that voters could actually look if they were going to go vote in person and assess what the wait time might be at a particular location and then um, perhaps choose to go to a location that maybe had a shorter wait time. Particularly important given the the need for. Um, or the social distancing uh, under the COVID uh, public health orders. Uh, we also uh, really um, emphasized the tools of our interactive sample ballot, which uh, allowed voters to mark their choices in advance of going to vote in person and to scan those into the system to expedite the, the process at the voting locations. Again, very important given the length of the ballot. And we instituted a quick check-in code that we put on our voter mailings so a voter could actually take that in and during that check-in process with the e-poll books, they could scan that in and that would expedite their, their process of, of check-in. We revamped the way we looked at, at selecting our vote centers. We did that uh, both based on the capacity issues from the March election, but also based on the public health needs, the fact that we needed larger locations where we could spread out our equipment, spread out our workers, um, have the appropriate um, PPE and, and protective equipment to make sure that voters didn't have to put themselves at, at risk, uh, their health at risk, uh, to, to go in and vote. Um, we 
a change to a new deployment and setup model where we actually use the third party to set up the, the vote centers that proved to be particularly important because that freed up our staff to focus on the logistics and the staffing of the vote centers while that company was out putting the equipment uh, in place and, and making, the, making sure the vote centers were already set up. We also established a, a new position at every vote center, a field technical support position at every location. So when there were issues of a technical nature, there was somebody on site to address those issues. And importantly, in this election, we uh, formed some great community partnerships where we were able to use uh, sports facilities, iconic locations in the county that proved particularly um, uh, helpful in the early voting period, but I would say beyond helpful, they also, I think, established a sense of of commitment and um, and spoke to the fact that we as a as a county and as a community, we're going to ensure that despite the challenges of the public health crisis, uh, that that our democratic process would still uh, be carried out uh, last week. And I will say that we far exceeded the minimum requirement of uh, vote centers. We would have been required under the law to have 570 vote center locations for a four day period. We ended up with uh, 793 locations uh, that were open for the final five day period and included in that were 118 that were open for a full 11 days leading up to the election. Um, we, we um, as, as was mentioned, we, we changed our election worker training, enhanced that um, through the support of your board. We used the disaster service worker model um, and had over 7,500 county employees working at our vote centers, uh, very pivotal to the success, um, augmented by student workers and community workers, uh, a total of over 16,000 people who uh, were working at, at those locations to ensure that the process uh, worked well. And finally, we had a, a very comprehensive voter outreach and education campaign um, with a strong, consistent message that I think paid off. And that strong, consistent message was, uh, in these conditions, people needed to make a plan to vote. Um, we, we gave them a tool where they could customize that plan. We emphasized for those who were able to, to vote safely from home using the vote by mail ballot and to choose from among the options for how to return that ballot. We encouraged people to vote early, uh, which was a a, a complete shift from what we saw in March where people really waited until the, the final hours to vote. And we used expanded digital communications to offer direct and timely messaging uh, to our voters. So the results uh, were, as, as was mentioned, uh, record turnout. While the percentage of registered voters is not a record, um, it's, still, it's still noteworthy. As of yesterday, we were at about 73% uh, voter turnout, and, and we're not done yet. We're still counting votes. But yesterday's count took us over the 4 million mark, um, more than 4 million votes cast in this election, which is the highest number of votes uh, cast in any election in L.A. County and in any local jurisdiction in the country. Uh, just to put that in perspective, our last record turnout as a percentage of voters was in the 2008 presidential election with about three point, just under 3.4 million votes cast. Uh, we now actually uh, have more, more votes cast in this election than we had registered voters in 2008. So uh, pretty, pretty phenomenal uh, in that regard. But the execution of this election was was uh, successful as well, as well. We really used that 10 day early voting period to ensure that we were ready for uh, anything that was gonna happen on election day. As a result, we, um, we didn't have issues that traditionally, even in the, the former election model that we, that we frequently dealt with in terms of lockouts of voting locations in the morning or no shows of our leads or assistant leads, um, those were for the most part um, non-existent in this election. So we met our goal of safe and secure voting uh, during the pandemic. Um, the vote by mail model, um, as I mentioned earlier, really turned out to be um, so fundamental to this. Uh, if you look at the results from yesterday's update, 80% of our turnout uh, were voters who used their vote by mail ballots. Now they used different methods for returning those vote by mail ballots, but that's a phenomenal number. Um, um, historically, LA County has been seen in the state of California as, as being the low, low propensity use of vote by mail ballots. And in this election, 80% of our turnout uh, used those ballots. And then 53% uh, of the returns, as I mentioned, uh, came back through the, the ballot drop-off uh, boxes. Um, the early voting and election day operations were smooth with minimal vote times uh, or minimal 
wait times where we did experience that kind of in the final hours of election day we were able to deploy additional resources to to uh, pick up that that extra capacity um, we had the technical agility by having uh, people on site to address issues as they came up um, and as a result of all of that with the um, early voting and the vote by mail process we were able to produce uh, substantial and more frequent updates uh, from the uh, of election results. So, for example, our very first uh, results shortly after uh, eight o'clock after the polls closed represented 2.3 million ballots. Uh, and prior to that, uh, the highest we had had at that early report in an, in an election was about 300,000 ballots. So a, a substantial increase there. As of yesterday, um, we had added almost 1 million ballots to what we had counted on election day. Uh, and for seven days out, that's, uh, that's uh, very different than what we've seen before. Just to put, again, put that in perspective, if you go back two years um, to the 2018 election, we were at this point, a week after the election, we were still in the process of, of dealing with about uh, 400,000 or more provisional ballots. And in this election, uh, our provisional ballots were down to uh, roughly 2,000 ballots. So uh, that really changed our ability to count more frequently and get more substantial results out uh, to the public. So as we look ahead, I, I think that the good news is that uh, we can now say, I think with confidence that the voting model uh, that we've adopted in LA County is sustainable and it's well established uh, by the action of your board and the way that the, the um, Voters' Choice Act is written. Uh, this model of mailing ballots to every registered voter in um, all, all elections going forward uh, is, is in place. That, that is the model that, that will, will be used. Um, we know we have more elections to come. Uh, the, the first one is probably going to be in early 2021 to, uh, to fill the, the Senate vacancy of uh, Supervisor-Elect Holly Mitchell's district. So that, that is uh, something we're monitoring right now. Uh, we know we need to continue to build capacity. We need to, we were fortunate um, in some ways because of the pandemic that we were able to use facilities that were otherwise not being used um, for other activities and that helped us a great deal so we need to we need to be proactive in in planning ahead for when those facilities may not be available um, and then uh, we need to continue to build on the benefits of what we've established here um, in la county as as the the first publicly owned voting system in the country which enables us to um, to more frequently do enhancements and refinements to that based to, based on changes in legislation, changes on, in technology, and changes in voting behavior. So um, with that, just to, to, to wrap up, uh, I just wanna reiterate again that this was a full county effort. Uh, we had tremendous support from um, your board, from the CEO, from other county departments. Um, it's always dangerous to, to list specific uh, departments, but I do want to uh, specifically thank Dr. Farrar and Department of Public Health for their partnership, um, Lisa Garrett and DHR for their partnership with the um, disaster service workers, uh, and Dr. Duardo from the LA County Office of Education for helping us uh, to, to kind of get through barriers with using schools as voting facilities. Um, I want to thank the the team here at the Registrar Recorder County Clerk who really put their all into this. Um, there, there were there was certainly was an opportunity or or the possibility that people would uh, abandon this, um, given what to, what we went through in March, and um, and instead people, you know, pulled up their bootstraps and got to work and and put everything they could into making November a success, and we did that with uh, a lot of great partners, our our vendor partners, our manufacturing partner, um, and your board. So. Um, the promise of VSAP, I think, was fully realized in this election, and that's something that we collectively in this county have worked at uh, very hard. I think it, it's put us on the map in some regard, uh, and I think a, a great way to sum it up would be to say that, you know, from a 95-year-old uh, voter to a Generation Z voter and everything in between, uh, this system worked as it was designed, and it got overwhelmingly positive reviews in its utility and in the intuitive ease of its use. So um, we have, you know, we've succeeded. It was a bumpy road, but we've succeeded in designing and implementing a voter-focused uh, voting system. And when I look around at at what we're what we've seen in the last week in terms of what um, our colleagues in other states um, 
have been facing. Uh, it makes me really proud of the collaboration and the hard work that has taken place here. It's still hard work, it continues, um, and we still have to continue to uh, improve it as we go, uh, but we made a lot of progress this year. And so I appreciate the, the support of your board and um, look forward to what lies ahead. Thank you, Dean, for that. Supervisor Hahn, do you have any other questions or comments? Supervisor Solis? Yes, thank you, Madam Chair. And uh, thank you, uh, Dean Logan, for your presentation and you know success uh, on this uh, election. I, I think it was really hard. We learned a lot, but you carried it through. So a big high five to you and to your staff, and especially to all the county employees that were out there manning these voting centers and helping people and the volunteers. We had some folks that I ran into that said they were doing it for 20 years or nine years or 10 years, and you had the diversity that lined up there beautifully. Um, and to see record numbers of people voting was just incredible. I'm glad that we encouraged people to vote by mail. That That's why we were able to elude having those backed up lines when it came down to you know voting that Tuesday. And I, I really have to say thank you. I know we had a lot of little minor bumps, but some of it wasn't our fault, like the incident in Baldwin Park, where we had someone uh, actually try to set on fire some of the ballots in one of the boxes there. But luckily, all that was, was uh, mended. We took care of it. And thanks to you and your speedy effort and, and listening to us. And I want to tell you that I really believe we have something going there when we advertise that we're going to have voting centers in popular, iconic settings like the Dodgers Stadium that's in the 1st District and Staples Center, which is in the 1st District, as well as the Fairplex. And I just have to say that um, the enthusiasm on the part of the public being able to access those places was phenomenal. And especially for helping us put up sites in the Southeast LA and East LA district, you know, at the last minute, even if it was just for a vote, by, even if it was just a flex vote center, that helped out. I can tell you that. I visited one in particular at Lincoln Plaza Hotel in Monterey Park that was a project room key site and it's still one. I was incredibly honored and pleased to see that people there and the community were coming in and voting. But thank you for opening up those centers in Huntington Park, Walnut Park Elementary School, East LA Library, and Eastmont Community Center. I personally visited all these places and want to tell you how impactful all of this has been. So great job. We learned a lot. I look forward to seeing the full debrief and assessment once the election results are completed and certified and how we can improve upon the system. So thank you so much, Dean, for your hard work. You deserve a break. <laughs> so thank you. High five to you. Thank you. Thank you, Supervisor. Thank you, Supervisor Kuehl, and then Supervisor Ridley Thomas. Thank you very much, Madam Chair. Dean, I want to add my congratulations and my gratitude. Um, it's interesting watching uh, those who are in charge of elections all around the country, even today <clears throat> on the news, talking about how important it is for the people to have trust in that process have trust in those systems. And um, I think it, that you uh, so interestingly took a really, really big step in that arena for the residents and the voters in the County of Los Angeles. Um, like my colleagues, uh, the feedback that I got from uh, workers from my office, workers from the departments, um, voters in my neighborhood, um, friends, everybody all around was so incredibly positive. I mean, I think that people felt very secure, well prepared, not overly pressured, and not surprisingly, one of the biggest reasons was that so many people could vote by mail or vote uh, and drop off their ballot in one of the ballot boxes. Um, and so uh, the last three or four days, we saw some lines, but, you know, there would be three people, six people, maybe ten at the most, uh, mostly. And it was just a very different experience. I also think it's interesting, some of my um, senior volunteers who still felt like they wanted to venture out and, you know, be there even in the midst of the pandemic, um, we're very, very pleased to have so many more younger people 
joining them as volunteers. And the mix was uh, an interesting thing. My uh, my volunteers noticed that a voter, when they had a question, would go generally to someone their age or someone who kind of looked like them, which we do a lot um, in our lives without thinking about it. So I encourage you to continue seeing if you know you can get people to volunteer but i think it should be a mainstay every election that we use our county employees that we um find ways to uh encourage them and make certain that they're recognized for it because the training is long as you know um but they did such a great job your staff overall did a magnificent job and I, I think people really liked going to a place with a ballot already filled out. Uh, I saw people in the park where I actually deposited my ballot doing little happy dances after they, you know, deposited their ballot and um, doing selfies with the deposit boxes. So I, I think the, the choice for everybody was a big deal, too. And um, so congratulations and deepest, deepest thanks. Thank you. Thank you, Madam. Thank you, Supervisor Kuehl. Supervisor Ridley Thomas. Uh, Madam Chair, uh, Supervisor Hahn, thanks for bringing in the motion. Uh, we are essentially seven days removed from what was an historic election and two days removed from history being made all over again. It's in full recognition of the weight of the moment and full acknowledgement of all who came before. I want to exercise a point of personal privilege to the extent that it's acceptable, Madam Chair, and uh, take just a moment to recognize not only the election of Vice President Joe Biden, but the election of Senator Kamala Harris as the first African-American person of color to hold the office of Vice President, to be elected to that office. Her candidacy is the representation of so many promises finally fulfilled, so many hopes and dreams. We also acknowledge uh, the 4 million Los Angeles County residents who cast their ballot on November uh, the 3rd safely and securely. The county took significant steps to plan for the wide array of logistical, constitutional, and political complexities, including the extraordinary public health risk of the coronavirus pandemic. In light of the voting experience reported in other states, I'm proud of the efforts here in the County of Los Angeles to expand voting options, reduce barriers, and make voting more accessible. It is, after all, what the Voting Rights Act and its best manifestation is about. So on Election Day, wait times in the second district remained under 30 minutes throughout the day. And it was a day without uh, any significant uh, incident or hiccup, which is the best and highest compliment or endorsement uh, that the um, register recorder county clerk could be afforded. So we thank you, Dean Logan, for your leadership, your endurance. We thank your staff and all the stakeholders that led to an outcome uh, that we can all celebrate with a high degree of praise and recognition. Madam Chair. Thank you, Supervisor Ridley Thomas. And I, going last, I think everything that, that's been said, um, I echo everything. And Dean, you know, I'm very proud of the fact that um, with a few, in the beginning, you quickly uh, rectified the issues and didn't let that get in your way in terms of moving forward. And there's no question in my mind, um, COVID definitely presented um, a lot of uh, issues for some people who had a fear, but you, um, through the work that, we, that, that was done through the volunteers, um, made sure that each voting place was safe. So I just wanna thank you uh, on behalf of all 10 million constituents, um, for really making LA County proud. And I think that, as you said, this is a system that moving forward, um, we've got lessons learned, but we will always be looking to, to 
to make it better. But at this point, I have to say job well done. And, uh, you know, please thank your staff. And I want to thank all the volunteers. And I know that we all were originally concerned about the amount of hours each person would be putting in. But I, I know my staff, not one complained. They felt it was an honor to be a part of this historical um, uh, uh, time. And there's no question in my mind that uh, together um, you made it happen with many volunteers, but you as a lead um, set the tone. So good job. Thank you very much. So with that, um, I'm seeing if uh, item 65A is before us. Supervisor Hahn is going to is going to make the motion to move it, seconded by Supervisor Solis to receive and file the report. If there are no objections, that will be the order. Now we're going to go back to item number 30, which was held by Supervisor Ridley Thomas. It's the Harbor UCLA Medical Center Replacement Program. Thank you, Madam Chair. Our board spends a lot of time focusing on how to best serve the needs of the residents of Los Angeles County. And indeed, the built environment where our services are provided, particularly for the provision of health care, is a critical um, component of that. Uh, the Harbor UCLA Hospital was built in the year 1962. Unfortunately, it has not withstood the test of time. It is indisputably our most outdated campus and the hospital will not meet seismic requirements by the year 2030. And it is our sole remaining facility where many patients have to share rooms with up to uh, three other patients. If you experience more than one working elevator upon entering the building, uh, you should consider yourself lucky. Of course, the complete transformation of this campus, which is needed uh, to provide care in an environment that promotes the dignity and worth of both our patients and our employees, requires substantial investment. I held this item to acknowledge the tremendous need and to thank the team that has helped devise a plan to address it. I'm pleased that the county is moving forward with what promises to be a state-of-the-art inpatient building, both for psychiatric and general uses. May I then thank uh, both Dr. Christina Galley and Dr. John Sharon for their collaboration on this. I also want to thank um, the CEO's team, led by Dave Howard, Brad Bolger, and Amir Alam, who worked tirelessly, Madam Chair and, and members of the board, with the uh, Department of Public Works and Harbor UCLA campus uh, leadership to refine the scope and budget in a manner that enables us to move forward. The implementation of these new facilities will be done in tandem with that of the Lundquist Institute, which will make a make it a premier location in the region not just for patient care but for innovation research and biomedical progress uh, harbor ucla provides care for some of the most vulnerable members of our society specifically within the south and western portions of the county uh, the transformation of this campus over the coming decade will allow the county to make the best use of our land in a manner that allows our patients to be best served, whether it's in an ambulatory or inpatient setting, or through the cutting edge work being done by the Lundquist Institute. I'm simply excited to see that this integrated and cohesive vision will in fact take shape, Madam Chair. I thank you for this opportunity. Thank you, Supervisor Ridley Thomas. Seeing that no one else is requested to speak on this item, this motion of the board is moved by Supervisor Ridley Thomas. I will second it. To approve this item, Madam Executive Officer, please call the roll. Item 30 is before you, Supervisor Solis. Aye. Supervisor Solis, aye. Supervisor Ridley Thomas? Aye. Supervisor Ridley Thomas, aye. Supervisor Kuehl? Aye. Supervisor Q, aye. Supervisor Hahn? Aye. Supervisor Hahn, aye. Supervisor Barger? Aye. 
Supervisor Barger, aye. Motion carries five to zero. Now we'll move on to item number 60, settlement of the matter entitled Brian Charles Twyman et al. versus County of Los Angeles. It was held by Supervisor Ridley Thomas. Uh, Madam Chair and members of the board, uh, this settlement agreement resulting from the deputy involved shooting of Ryan Twyman is a sobering reminder of the families and communities need for justice, healing, and compassion. Although a $3.9 million settlement uh, is unusually large, it is no substitute for justice. Uh, justice indeed requires an investigation with legally mandated oversight by uh, the Office of the Inspector General to ensure that careless tragedies like this one are not repeated. Such oversight is a critical part of addressing the lack of training and accountability and uh, the failure of leadership to address issues that continue to afflict the department. Beyond the wrongful death of Mr. Twyman and the costly settlement that is attached to it, a lasting consequence of this incident is the painful trauma and grief that it causes his family, his friends, and the community at large. This tragedy, Madam Chair, further underscores the need for uh, this board to continue building on the work of the Family Assistance Program, the Office of Violence Prevention, and other compassionate trauma-informed services that help families and communities heal from grief and trauma. Uh, there's still a lot of work to do, we know that, and I hope we will continue to build on uh, these best practices, uh, these promising practice in term, practices in terms of trauma and violence prevention and treatment. These efforts can and do make a difference. Therefore, we must continue to provide them and make them better. Madam Chair. Thank you, Supervisor Ridley Thomas. <clears throat> Are there any other supervisors that would like to make remarks on this item? Hearing none, item 60 is before us, moved by Supervisor Ridley Thomas, seconded by Supervisor Hahn to approve this item. Madam Executive Officer, please call the roll. Item 60 is before you, Supervisor Solis. Supervisor Solis? Supervisor Ridley Thomas? Aye. Supervisor Ridley Thomas, aye. Supervisor Kuehl? Supervisor Kuehl, aye. Supervisor Hahn? Aye. Supervisor Hahn, aye. Supervisor Barger? Aye. Supervisor Barger, aye. Motion carries five to zero. We are now moving on to item six. Four to zero. Sorry, four to zero. Four, four to zero. Yeah, I'll, I'll text them. We're now moving on to 65F. Recognizing November 11th, 2020 as Veterans Day in the county. That was held by Supervisor Kuehl. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. You know, nothing reminds me of how far apart we are and how what we're missing really uh, by not being on the dais as, as much as thinking of the people that we would honor each week um, and, uh, you know, the kind of ceremony in which we engaged. And I, uh, I just thought, rather than just let this go by, I wanted to take a little time, not too much, to recognize our nation's veterans and to shed some light on LA County's commitment to veterans and to their family members. Um, in 2019, Congress approved the 75th anniversary of World War II Commemoration Act, uh, re recognizing the end of World War II. Uh, was known as Victory in Europe Day or VE Day to honor and thank all of our veterans of World War II. And the act calls for a year-long tribute to educate the public and pay tribute to the contributions made by our veterans of World War II. In LA County alone, we will honor the lives of nearly 90,000 veterans, including an estimated 21,053 World War II veterans who have been laid to rest at the Los Angeles National Cemetery, which I'm very proud to say is located in the third district, as well as veterans of all eras who are our friends, our family, our neighbors among us. This year, LA County has taken some major steps to better serve our veterans and their families 
through a public-private partnership between the Department of Mental Health, the Department of Military and Veterans Affairs, local veteran-serving organizations, academic institutions, philanthropy, and most importantly, members of the military community across the eras. The county has launched the Veteran Peer Access Network, or VPAN. In this program, veteran peers engage their fellow military community members in need and help them in navigating access to necessary resources. In addition to launching this novel program, our Department of Military and Veterans Affairs, under the leadership of General Ruth Wong, has spent months creating a video about the rich history of World War II and connecting with our surviving LA County World War II veterans and their families to preserve that history for all of those who come after. I've asked General Wong and Dr. John Sharon to speak very briefly today about each department's contributions to the veteran community. But before they speak, I want to express immense gratitude and support to our nation's veterans and our current service members as we bring in Veterans Day 2020 tomorrow. So if I may, I'd like to ask uh, just two minutes from General Wong and two from Dr. Sharon, if that's all right, Madam Chair. Absolutely. General Wong? Yes, good afternoon, well, Supervisor Kuehl, Madam Chair, and Board of Supervisors. To all the veterans and their families in Los Angeles County, we thank you for serving our country and honor those veterans who continue to serve their community through acts of kindness, whether it be visiting the sick, serving meals, volunteering at hospitals and food distribution centers, or providing transportation. Thank you. 2020 will be remembered for many things, including COVID-19. But we should not forget that 75 years ago was the ending of World War II. Over 16 million Americans served during the war. Some did not come home, and those that did, we call our unsung heroes. Servicemen and women from all ethnic and racial backgrounds contributed to Allied victory in 1945, proving that when we all fight for one common goal, we can achieve anything. This year, since we are not able to honor our World War II veterans with a special in-person program, we instead created a documentary film that speaks to their heroism. This film is dedicated to our nation's brave men and women who answered the call to serve our country. We must never forget the reason for fighting. Our goal is to create a legacy of our heroes so their children grandchildren, and future generations will remember their contribution, dedication, and sacrifice. The film is available on our department's Facebook page, as well as our county channel 36. It is our hope that these stories resonate with each of you, perhaps reminding you of a friend or a relative and that you enjoy hearing these impactful stories from the greatest generation. On behalf of our County Department of Military and Veterans Affairs, we thank you for your service to our country and continue to honor the 300,000 veterans in Los Angeles County and their families who have sacrificed so much. Thank you to the Board of Supervisors for the opportunity to speak today. Happy Veterans Day to our veterans and our families. Thank you, Dr. Sharon. Uh, thank you very much uh, to, to the board uh, and especially to Supervisors Kuhl and Barger for featuring uh, veterans and veterans. Love and all is every day. Why? Speaks the nature of military service. On the counter for our United States of America, as our first president George Washington is often credited as stating about 23 decades ago, the willingness with which our young people are likely to serve in any war, no matter how justified, shall be directly proportional to how they perceive the veterans of early earlier wars 
were treated and appreciated by their nation. We must never forget this notion. Our veterans must be honored and celebrated every day, and in an especially public way on Veterans Day, which is tomorrow, 11-11. On that note, this board in our county, led by the Department of Military and Veteran Affairs and the Department of Mental Health, are showing big appreciation by establishing the Veteran Peer Access Network. This new program, which is undergoing significant expansion right now, offers veterans and military families the opportunity to serve as battle buddies for others in the military community who are experiencing reintegration challenges in civilian life, whether it be due to undereducation, unemployment, mental illness, addiction, criminal justice involvement, or other issues that lead to isolation, homelessness, and increase the risk of suicidal thinking and behavior. Let me end by saying that at the same time the VPAN is a workforce development initiative for veterans, it is a highly informed and strategic investment of our taxpayer dollars that recognizes veterans as civic assets and leaders whose commitment to service must be leveraged more across our systems to uplift our communities across the board. Thank you for this chance to address the board and to pay respect to our veterans. Thank you, Dr. Sharon. Madam Chair, can I say something? Yeah, I, I want to say something as co-author, but I want to see if oh, Sweater yeah, Kuehl is, is finished. Sweater Kuehl? Uh, yes, Madam Chair, thank you for co-authoring. Please go ahead. Okay, thank you. Yeah, I want to thank you, Sweater Kuehl, for allowing me to co-author this motion. Veterans Day serves as a reminder of the sacrifices made by all the men and women who have served in our armed forces. As we near almost two decades of the war on terror, it's important to remember that our post 9-11 veterans have been at the forefront of this conflict. The military and veterans are a part of the fabric of this, of this county and of this country. And I would like to recognize the estimated 300,000 veterans that reside, reside in the county and estimated 700 employees in the county workforce concurrently serving in the armed forces. As a county, we are committed to working to provide our veterans, service members, and their families access to services and benefits that they have rightfully earned. This year, we moved to address the issue of veteran suicides through the feasibility study of a countywide veteran suicide review team, which is currently being worked on by county, state, and federal agencies in collaboration with county partners. As Supervisor Kuehl, said we also are continuing to provide services through the Department of Military and Veterans Affairs, the Veteran Peer Access Network within the County Department of Mental Health, and the Veterans Mental Evaluation Team through the Sheriff's Department. We've also placed homeless veterans as a priority to get housed in this county. There is no question that while tomorrow is Veterans Day, each and every day, we should honor our veterans for their sacrifices and thank them for their service. So I would like to thank all of those who have served and to the men and women who are currently serving all over the world for your service to our nation. Thank you. Supervisor Hahn. Thank you, Madam Chair. I just really just wanted to add my uh, appreciation both to uh, Supervisor Kuehl and you and of course to uh, all of our veterans in Los Angeles County. Thank you, General Wong, for your comments. Dr. Sharon, for your comments as well. Uh, I remember last year we had the first ever Veterans Day LA, uh, and we held it at the Los Angeles Memorial Coliseum uh, with the help of our uh, Department of Military and Veterans Affair. And I know that they are continuing that work this year. Uh, of course, it's got to be virtual, uh, but I look forward to when we can again in person um, have Veterans Day LA uh, for uh, the remembrance of all of our veterans. My dad was a proud veteran of World War II. He was he served in the, the Navy um, and proudly wore his Veterans of Foreign Wars little hat uh, always on Veterans Day. So thank you to all of our veterans. And I agree, it's just, it seems like that's the one um, nerve that strikes uh, people equally here in LA County is the, the shame of having veterans 
who are homeless and sleeping on our streets, the fact that they have served their country with distinction and honor and yet now don't have a roof over their head. And um, I know I'm going to recommit myself to uh, finishing a project that I've started in my district in Downey, which will be 80 apartments for formerly homeless uh, veterans and their family. So thank you for bringing us forward, Supervisor Kuehl, and uh, let us take a moment tomorrow to remember uh, our, our veterans and what they mean to us and, again, recommit ourselves to adding resources um, so that uh, we can um, really address the mental health challenges that many of them have. They may, uh, their injuries on the battlefield have lasted uh, to uh, mental health challenges off the battlefield, but we know they're no less uh, serious or severe. So thank you very much, and uh, I honor our veterans everywhere tomorrow. Thank you. Thank you, thank you Supervisor Hahn. Supervisor Solis? Yes, thank you so much. I want to thank Supervisor Kuhl and, and uh, you, Madam Chair, for bringing this forward. I join you in honoring our servicemen and women, and also remind people that today is also Marine Corps 245th birthday. So I want to wish them a very happy birthday. And along with all of you, I just want to let the folks know in our district and the first district tomorrow at Atlantic Park in East LA, we'll be hosting a virtual celebration for veterans at 11 o'clock. And on Friday, we are hosting a food bank drive dedicated to our veterans in East Los Angeles on Mednick Avenue, Belvedere Park. And that'll start at 9 a.m. Thank you very much, Madam Chair. Hello? Anybody home? I'm here. <laughs> what happened? Where is our chair? Uh oh, it sounds like some somebody got cut off. She's gone. Yeah, maybe let's, she's gone. Let's move on. Oh, okay, just so, kidding, Catherine. <laughs> so let's call. Is she is she out? Okay, then let's call a vote on this. Right, this item is before us. Sixty five F, moved by Supervisor Q, seconded by Barger, who stepped away momentarily. Uh, please call the roll. They're all gone. There you are. Here. Are you there? <laughs> Hello? Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. Calling the roll. Hello? Yeah. Yes, say something. Yeah. 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 Hello? Yeah. 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 something, please. Oh, I'm speaking. Hello, testing. Can you hear me? Yes. Uh, okay. Can you yeah. hear me? Yeah, Catherine, we can hear you. Okay, because I don't, for some reason, it didn't work. Keep your, keep your mic on. Okay. So call the roll so, now. Yes, yeah. Supervisor, we were calling it, but no one was answering. So we thought you all couldn't hear us, <laughs> but you couldn't. Uh, Go 65F ahead. is before you, Supervisor Solis. Aye. Supervisor Solis, aye. Supervisor Billy Thomas. Aye. Supervisor Billy Thomas, aye. Supervisor Kuehl. Aye. Supervisor Kuehl, aye. Supervisor Hahn. Aye. Supervisor Hahn, aye. Supervisor Barger. Aye. Supervisor Barger, aye. Motion carries five to zero. Now we move on to item A4, a discussion and consideration of necessary actions relating to the county's homeless crisis as requested at the board meeting of May 17th, 2016. Supervisor Ridley Thomas, you have the floor. Thank you very much, Madam Chair. In January of this year, uh, Mayor Darrell Steinberg and I, as co-chairs of the Governor's Council on Regional Homelessness Advisors, participated in the release of a comprehensive crisis response strategy. Uh, chief among those um, 40 strategies was a recommendation to secure ongoing state revenue to address homelessness. In February, the governor, uh, during a state of the state address, reiterated the uh, sustainable revenue, that sustainable revenue was needed to achieve sustainable outcomes related to homelessness. The Green California Home Plan is hoping to deliver on that sustainable revenue uh, notion uh, to aid our most vulnerable uh, residents. 
Madam Chair, uh, on November the 9th, a uh, statewide coalition of homelessness and housing advocates and organizations launched the Bring California Home Plan. The, the Cal Bring the California Home Plan uh, calls for California to invest $2.4 billion annually, which combined with federal and local resources could re reverse the cycle of homelessness in our county and throughout the state. Uh, to raise the needed revenue, the coalition's plan will consider closing loopholes uh, and addressing a range of issues that are fundamentally important to success. And so I uh, therefore move that we um, uh, authorize the county to co-sponsor the Bring California Home Plan and direct the Chief Executive Office's Sacramento office uh, staff to take all appropriate legislative advocacy actions to support this effort. I would so move, Madam Chair. Um, I would second, Madam Chair. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Lost <laughs> Sally, are you there? It's been moved and seconded. Hello, can you hear me? Yeah, it's been moved okay, and seconded. Okay, can you hear me now? Okay, there can you go. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, do not turn off your mic, because that's that's the key right there. Um, okay. It's been moved um, and seconded. Uh, we please call the roll? Item A4 is before you. Um, Supervisor Solis. Aye. Supervisor Solis, aye. Supervisor Riley Thomas. Aye. Supervisor Riley Thomas, aye. Supervisor Kuehl. Aye. Supervisor Kuehl, aye. Supervisor Hahn. Aye. Supervisor Hahn, aye. Supervisor Barger. I abstain. Supervisor Barger abstains. Four to zero with one abstention. That concludes the items on the agenda. Madam at this Chair? Time. Madam yes. Chair? I do yes. have a special that I wanted to bring in. Oh, I'm sorry, Supervisor Slees. Go ahead. Yes, uh, I have a motion and it's uh, equitable distribu distribution of COVID-19 vaccine. We heard, we had a great discussion and debate on this earlier. The County Department of Public Health daily COVID-19 reports and briefings provide an alarming and worrying insight to COVID-19 positivity and fatality rates in the disadvantaged and underserved communities of color. The board must prioritize an equitable distribution of vaccine throughout our Los Angeles County region, similar to the provisions of testing sites and other resources provided during the COVID pandemic. The health order compliance, outreach, education, and enforcement in the high-risk disadvantaged communities has been particularly challenging for our county public health and law enforcement officials. I therefore move that the Board of Supervisors direct the Department of Public Health to provide a report back to the board in 30 days that provides methodology for equitable distribution of the 20 million plus doses of COVID-19 vaccine prioritizing the county's COVID-19 testing sites county-owned properties such as senior centers and libraries, as well as federally qualified health clinics to serve as vaccine distribution sites. With that, Madam Chair, I ask for your eye vote. Okay, that's okay. Okay. Or can you hear me? Can you hear me now? I can hear you. Hello? Can you hear me? Hello, Supervisor? Yep. Can you hear me? Yes. What happened? Did we lose everybody? No, I'm, I'm so here. Are we vote, are we voting on this today, uh, yes. Supervisor Solis? Yes, we can. Uh huh. Okay. It's a report back. It's a report back. Okay. Okay. Would you second? I would. Okay. Uh, Catherine, are you on, Chairwoman? Hmm. But Sally, I can't. Let's just do what. Let's just do what we want, Hilda. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Celia, can you please call the roll? It's been moved by by myself and seconded by Han. Can we call the roll, please? Celia, where are you? I think the problem is that Celia and uh, our Catherine, Catherine are, are they're in the clear. they're in the same room. They got to turn on their phones. yeah. They're having trouble with their uh, access. Okay, I vote aye. <laughs> okay, so I'll call the roll then. Supervisor, oh, wait, wait, wait. That 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 doesn't work. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, I, because they'll be back on, and I think okay. we'll, we'll let's, uh, let's take a roll call vote on that when they come back on. What do you say, Madam Vice Chair? I have no, I have no problem. I mean, I'm we're teasing. 
I'm sure that we just lost know, communication yeah. for a short minute, but somebody should be calling them, tell them they should get on the phone or something. Yeah, I think they can hear, but they can't be heard. Oh, well. Oh, well, how about moving to so the maybe, motions? Yeah, let's move to adjournments. I think Janice is first. Janice, you want to uh, go? Okay, sure. Go ahead. Okay, so, um, and I know uh, uh, I have some adjournments, but I know, Sheila, you're probably going to be doing um, Alex Trebek, and I hope you will include uh, all members on that one. Um, I will, but, and I will. Thank you. But I move that when we adjourn today, we adjourn in the memory of Helen Cullen, who was 90 when she passed away. She was born uh, in New York. Uh, and uh, in 1953, she married James Cullen and lived in New Jersey until they moved out to California in 1956. Upon arriving in California, James and Helen settled in Torrance, where she worked for Hughes Aircraft until she stepped away to focus on raising her family. She was very dedicated to her family and their local community. She attended St. Philomena in Carson, where her children attended school. She dedicated herself to service as a poll worker, as school crossing guard, as well as volunteering for many years at Kaiser in Harbor City. She survived by her four children, her eight grandchildren, one of whom is my staff member, Chris Cullen, um, and eight great grandchildren. Uh, I also move that when we adjourn today, we adjourn in the memory of, of Anthony Tony Rodich, who was uh, 73 when he passed away. Tony was a man with a thousand stories, which apparently he told thousands of times. Tony was born and raised in San Pedro, and his life was dedicated to helping the community. He was involved in the Boys and Girls Club at a young age and was named Community Chest Boy of the Year. Tony loved sports. In high school, he lettered in football, baseball, and track, and went on to play both football and baseball for Harbor College. After his own athletic career ended, he coached senior league baseball and football. He appreciated all the connections he made through his years of being on team and was involved in arranging numerous team reunion. I got to know him because he was, uh, I guess he was almost a founding member of the San Pedro Sports Walk of fame. Uh, this was the Harbor Area's idea of uh, in in two main uh, uh, stars uh, for different athletes who had something to do with the Harbor Area. So all along downtown San Pedro, now all the way to the waterfront, you can see names of various um, athletes who are in the sidewalk, and that was he was very involved in that. He survived by his daughter Michelle, two grandchildren, his brother Jerry, and two sisters, Mary and Velma. And I move that when we adjourn today, we adjourn the memory of Clifford Irvin, who was a resident of Long Beach and a longtime Harbor Area community member. He passed away at 98. He was born in San Pedro and spent most of his life in Wilmington. Cliff served with the L.A. County Sheriff's Department for 27 years. He then went on to work for Pacific Bell as a lineman. Cliff dedicated much of his time to giving back to the community. He served for 14 years as a member of the California Senior Legislature and was an advocate for seniors in the justice system. Cliff was also an active member of the Masons, the Shriners, the American Legion, and Elks Club. He was preceded in death by his wife, Catherine. Cliff is survived by his foster daughter, Susan, and friend and caregiver, Cindy. I also move that when we adjourn today, we adjourn the memory of Rose Marie Bozanich, who was 90 when she passed away. She was a lifelong resident of San Pedro. Rose loved her family and her community. When she wasn't cooking and entertaining her loved ones, she could be found volunteering her time at Little Sister of the Poor. She was also an active member of several local organizations like Republican Women's Club, the Elks Club, the Dalmatian Club, Women's Auxiliary, where she served as the very first president. She was preceded in death by her husband, Bill. She survived by her children, Anthony and Suzanne, and her two grandchildren, Brian and Allison. And I move that when we adjourn today, we adjourn the memory of William Vincent, Bill, who was a, a resident of Rancho Palos Verdes, passed away at the age of 92. After serving our country during the Korean War, Bill went on to become a teacher and a football coach. He was a devoted Catholic and parishioner at Holy Trinity Catholic Church in San Pedro. 
Bill will be most remembered for his 34 years coaching in the South Bay, where he was known as the player's coach who cared deeply for his players. He was preceded in death by his eldest son, Gregory. He survived by his wife, Eileen, their five sons, 16 grandchildren, and one great-grandchildren. Thank you, Madam Chair. I'm back. So I move that we adjourn today. We do so in memory of Constant Bidgood, a former employee of Los Angeles County who recently passed away at the age of 87. Connie was preceded in death by her husband of 40 years, William Bidgood. After retiring from Los Angeles County, Connie and Bill spent many years living in Baja, California. They were longtime members of the Desert Sunrise Camper Club and the Lancaster Elks Lodge. Connie was a member and an officer of the Emblem Club through the Lancaster Elks Lodge. Connie is survived by three children, Edward, William, and Jeffrey, two stepchildren, Audrey and Cliff, six grandchildren, one step-grandchild, and 11 great-grandchildren. Also that we adjourn in memory of Karen Prehan, a resident of Duarte who recently passed away at the age of 68. Karen began her career as a Chamber of Commerce represented with the El Monte, South El Monte Chamber of Commerce in 1989 and became executive director in 1993. She began working in Monrovia in 2000 and was a former executive director of the Monrovia Chamber of Commerce. She worked in the Monrovia Chamber for many years before she started her final career as Nancy Bond Insurance Services. She loved shopping, decorating, house projects, and gardening. She was fun and funny, humble, and happily served others, most often in the background. Karen is survived by her two sons, Jason and Zachary, and four grandchildren. Also that we adjourn in memory of Dr. Marvin Breeder, a longtime Antelope Valley resident. Marvin was known for his support of local nonprofit organizations. He was an avid collector of words and was renowned for his ability to catch and capture his audience after reading the New York Times and Los Angeles Times daily for display of his vocabulary club meetings. Marvin has also re reveled as playing old guy tennis with his old guy friends. He loved opera, dining out, and socializing with friends and family. Marvin is survived by his wife, Sydney, children Mitchell, Heidi, and Charles, four grandchildren, and his and a sister. And last, I move that we adjourn in memory today of Alice Godfrey, a resident of San Marino who recently passed away at the age of 92. Alice earned her master's degree in education from Cal State LA, after which she was a director of the Gifted and Talented Education Program for the San Marino School District. She was a longtime educator, philanthropist, and volunteer, serving on the Board of Trustees of the San Domenico School for Girls, member of the Social Service League of Catholic Charities, and the Christ Child Society, led a Bible study program at St. Felicitas and Perpetua, and benefactor to the Carmelite Sisters of the Most Sacred Heart of Los Angeles. Known affectionately as Big Al and Mrs. Godfrey, she was known to respond with a warm smile and a hug. Alice is survived by six children, Peter, Stephen, Mary Alice, Sally, Joan, and Emily, her grandchildren and her great-grandchildren. So, Bill Supervisor Solis? Yes, thank you, Madam Chair. I move that when we adjourn today, we adjourn in memory of Gilbert Polanco Sr. He was a dedicated volunteer who gave 31 years of service to East Los Angeles and South Almani communities as a volunteer coach with the East L.A. Bobcats Youth Pop Warner football program and as a volunteer at Obregon Park coaching youth basketball and baseball and as a volunteer teaching youth how to fish at the Belvedere Park Fishing Club and assisting at countless Whittier Narrows all night catfish fishing derbies. Mr. Polanco was a committed husband, father, and grandfather. He's survived by his wife, Mary, son Gilbert Jr., and daughter Arlene. He'll be missed by park staff and the youth he coached, and the many friends he made along the way. May he rest in peace. I move that when we adjourn today, we adjourn in memory of David Baron, who passed away on November 1st at the age of 79. He served as the Monterey Park elected city clerk for 25 years. During his tenure, David oversaw the administration of countless incoming and outgoing council members, city managers, and staff. After his retirement, he remained involved in public service, including the Monterey Park Optimist Club and the Greater Monterey Park Chamber of Commerce. He also founded his own community newspaper, the West Valley Journal. He'll be missed by the Monterey Park community, and may he rest in peace. And lastly, I move that when we adjourn today, we adjourn in memory of Luisa Sanchez Baca. Luisa Sanchez Baca was 96. 
She died peacefully in the morning of October 23rd of this year. She was born in Puerto de Luna, New Mexico on February 13th, 1924. Luis was loved by everyone who came to know her for her kindness, wonderful spirit, and strong devotion to her family. Luis was a food service worker at the University of New Mexico and later as a friendly hostess at the McDonald's restaurant on 4th Street, retiring at the age of 87. She found much joy in attending a wide variety of events, be it museums or professional wrestling, but especially being around family. Luis is survived by her daughter, Rose Lee, and her sons, Manuel Baca, who is a Rio Hondo College Board of Trustee and longtime friend, and Mark, Richard, and Ben, along with 15 grandchildren and 18 great-grandchildren, as well as her extended family. May she rest in peace. And lastly, I move that we adjourn in memory of Mo Mona Gale Sparks Johnson. Mona Gale Sparks Johnson was born on March 11, 1948 in Orville, Ohio, passed away on October 24th of this year at the age of 72. She enrolled in the military and completed her commitment to the Navy in 1969. Shortly after, she relocated to the city of Claremont in L.A. County, where she began her career at Mount St. Mary's College as an instructor and worked there for 32 years. Ms. Sparks Johnson always brought hope, strength, and courage to the people she encountered. She loved advocating for those who needed help and encouraged many of others to follow their dreams. She was the former president of the National Council of Black Women and held a seat on the governing board of the Tri-City Mental Health in the city of Pomona. She was a member of the National Alliance of Mental Illness, the Business and Professional Women Organization, and the Antioch Missionary Baptist Church. She was survived by her husband, Floyd Johnson, her three sons, Danelle, Jarrett, and Floyd Johnson II, 11 grandchildren, one brother, three sisters, and a host of extended family members and friends who will all miss her dearly. Thank you very much, Madam Chair. Thank you, Supervisor Ridley Thomas. Chair, uh, I'd ask that we adjourn in memory of Diane De Prima. She was born August 6th, 1934 in Brooklyn, New York, and passed away at the age of 86 on October the 25th in San Francisco um, after a battle with Parkinson's disease. She graduated uh, high school and then attended uh, Swarthmore College. Um, for two years before dropping out to pursue her passion of becoming a poet, and a poet she was. Her poetry uh, debut came in 1958 with the release of collected poems titled This Kind of Bird Flies Backward. She relocated to San Francisco in 1968 and after partnering with City Lights, a popular iconic bookstore and publishing house, she published more than 40 poetry collections, novels, and memoirs. Her final um, major poetry collection, titled The Poetry Deal, was released in 2014. Uh, in 2009, Ms. De Primo was named the Poet Laureate of San Francisco by former Mayor Gavin Newsom. Uh, she will be remembered as a feminist poet of the Beat Generation, a devoted mother, a champion for other uh, female artists and for her artistic contributions that dramatically changed the course of 20, 20th century literature. Ms. De Prima is survived by her partner of 42 years, uh, Shepard Powell, five children, Alexander, Dominique, uh, Jean, Rudy, um, Tara, two brothers, four grandchildren, uh, three great-grandchildren, extended family, friends, and those of the arts community who will miss her dearly. She is um, the mother of our very own Dominique de Prima, who hosts front page on radio station KJLH. Um, Madam President, Madam Chair, and colleagues, um, I'd ask that you join me in uh, acknowledging the passing of Dr. Donald Henderson, born January 15, 1946, in Jacksonville, Florida. And he passed on November the 1st in Tarzana at the age of 74. He was an alumnus of Howard University, the University of Florida, and Harvard University, where he received his undergraduate uh, 
medical and master's degrees respectively. As a practicing physician, uh, Donald Henderson operated in offices in Inglewood in Los Angeles while caring for patients at Cedar sinai and Sentinel, at Sentinella Medical Centers. He served on several boards, including the American Cancer Society, Blue Shield of California, and the Advocates of Professional Golf Association Tour. Uh, Dr. Henderson will be remembered as an avid golfer uh, for his warm smile, welcoming demeanor, attentiveness to his patients and their families, his willingness to assist those in need, and love for his family. He is survived by his wife, Monica, the children, Dax, Shasta, and Eric, um, uh, who is a deputy in my uh, office here. Uh, three siblings, Carol, Daryl, and Joyce, his cousin, Patty, uh, extended family and friends, colleagues in the medical community who will miss uh, Donald Henderson most assuredly. Uh, Madam Chair and colleagues, I'd ask that you uh, join me in adjourning.